tweet my own thing here. Yeah, uh, that's good. Hey, if you got this part of the video, you've got the live unedited edition. Home Gadget Geeks, it is uh, the first one of the new year, January 4th, 2018. And ooh, I better change that in my show notes so I can get that right. I didn't uh, I didn't do that. Here with Paul Barron. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. We've got this part on uh, Google Plus or on YouTube. And it's not live. Hang tight. We'll get started in a minute or two, maybe three, maybe five. Who knows? But uh, whatever it takes for us to get going. It'll be a few minutes, though. It won't be very long. A little bit of pre-show. And we want to thank you for us. If you're in the chat room, I see Mark out there. Mark and Ken, I see guest one. Guest one, if you want to sign out and sign back in with uh, a name, that's always helpful. So I know who you are. You don't have to. Firing Welcome up chat. You guys to the program. Ken, hopefully, Ken might be on the road listening. If you're listening live on Spreaker, we want to welcome you to that as well. I've been having some, Paul, I've been having some bandwidth issues over the last, I don't know, month or two. Very sporadic. Could not nail it down. I was just, it was super frustrating. I had no idea it was coming and it was going and it would happen during the show and then it would go away. And like I kept trying to isolate it and it came down to one of my cryptocurrency servers. You know, I'm doing SIA as mm -hmm. an experiment. And when I first set that thing up, it was relatively low bandwidth. But for some reason, I think because my contracts are getting ready to renew or something, there's been a ton of traffic and a ton of up traffic. And, you know, with Cox, the 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 better is down, not up. So early when I was accepting contracts and taking storage, of course, there was no problem because it got plenty of down speed. But now that people are pulling their files back, uh, the the up speed is at a premium, and it was just crushing my up speed um, transactions. So uh, I killed it for the night. That should uh, that should put us back. And then I got to figure out if I'm going to keep doing that or not because it was just it was brutal what it was doing to my upload. And of course, I can't have a server just taking over when in a, whenever it wants, you know, and just obliterating my upload speed. So I'll have to reconsider. What Cox uh, plan are you on? They're Let's highest speak. here, but it's like 160 and 10, which is just stupid. Like, I, give me some more up. I need <laughs> up. I don't need down. I need up. Yeah. Yeah, we made the move to um, well, Doxis 3 and 16 channel cable modems, and they bus boosted me up from three to 300 down and 30 up. So oh, nice. that's, nice. yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's rare that it here. uses that. If I'm uploading a huge 4K video to YouTube or something, I might see it. Um, Are you and you're capped at one terabyte yeah, or more? I paid to remove the cap. We can talk oh, about that yeah. on the air too. But yeah, yeah. So you and I have had been comparing notes uh, on Cox for yeah. years. Yeah. Saw it coming and it finally happened. Yeah. So you're paying the 150 or whatever is the. Oh, yeah. Plus cable. So way more than that. Oh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yikes. Uh, can you guys hear us out there in the chat room? Just a quick sound check. I want to make sure. I indeed put everything where it's supposed to be tonight. I think I did, but I'll just double check. Yeah, okay. So uh, Mark's obviously hearing us since he's talking to us, so that's good. And yeah, I, ought to, I think it's, for me, I think it's an extra 99 to get unlimited. And uh, I'm already paying it in almost 100. So it's like, uh, I don't know, most months... I can manage the band kit, the bandwidth cap pretty well. My daughter was home at Christmas, so you'll appreciate this. So I couldn't for the whole time she was in high school, and I had unlimited bandwidth with Cox. All she would use was the data on her phone. She was always saying, "Oh no, I can't connect to the Wi-Fi. It doesn't work." Blah blah blah. So, and we didn't. We had Sprint, and we didn't have unlimited bandwidth. But then, uh, finally, so Sprint really gives us kind of truly unlimited. It's capped at certain at certain levels but not capped but it slows down then um so i finally we, we pretty much can do whatever she wants and now that she's home on co from college she attaches to the wi-fi and just crushes it and i'm like oh no no use your lte now use your <laughs> lte uh, so i'm gonna have to when she's home again i'm gonna have to remind her she's back in school now i won't you know we won't really see her much till christmas or, i mean till uh, summer so it sounds like you've had overages then, huh? You've been bit? No, no, I've been lucky. I've been able to manage it right up to it, but I'm at like 733 gig right now and I've got like eight or nine days left. So, you know, if it doesn't, um, I think I'll be fine, but I, I definitely am ready to, was ready to cut that server off if um, it was going to, if it was going to cause overages. 
I still think I'm going to cut it off. I didn't, one of the mistakes I made, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about, I guess, you know, when you're thinking about uh, storage and bandwidth, right. And if I have a cap, all of a sudden, then my bandwidth becomes a premium. Cause if there, if people are storing files on my network, if we're sharing it that way, and they could, if they, depending on how much they move it, right. That could, if I rent them a terabyte, which is pretty inexpensive. And then they move that just one time in the month, they've, they've consumed, you know, my bandwidth cap. So now my bandwidth becomes a premium if I'm going to offer this kind of service, right? So I need to charge more for the bandwidth to encourage them just to put the data there to kind of set it and forget it. Like that's what, that's what Amazon does in a lot of ways is they penalize you. It's cheap to store it, but they penalize you if you move it around a lot because the bandwidth's expensive. So yeah, no, it, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, you get the faster speeds and you can blow through it quicker and your phone, same kind of deal. Um, just a quick thing, by the way, before we go uh, live for the recording, right? We're just live for on air at the moment for yeah. people on YouTube. So if you look at a uh, Twitter DM, uh, there's the outline you kind of asked for, some blocks of text. So we'll use that as our channel. And I have chat wing in a separate window. Uh, I did a bandwidth test. I don't think anyone noticed, but uh, I'll go ahead and freeze the video that shows what's live and keep chat wing open. Okay, I think I have everything arranged. Um, I think I'm ready to go when you are. Yeah, just a little, just a little after. Okay, how many people we have? Okay, uh, just a handful out there. Oh. Three out there in chat. Maybe a few on on Spreaker. They'll they'll jump in as we as we get going here. I've got a few stuff to do up front, so let me get that out of the way, and then we'll get started here. Let me let's see. This is three forty. Here we go. This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek Show number three forty, recorded on January fourth, twenty eighteen. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios here in a actually a heat wave, a little warmer, Bellevue, Nebraska. Uh, if 17 is warmer, it was negative 20 <laughs> later in the week. Paul, you're uh, you're getting a little snow. Maybe the cold's coming your way. Are you gonna, just going to survive the snow apocalypse? <laughs> yeah, light, fluffy stuff. It was low 20s when it fell here in Connecticut today, so... I'm in central Connecticut. We had about a foot and I just finished clearing it less oh, than wow. an hour ago. Yeah, that's actually quite a bit. Uh, yeah, but again, light fluffy is no big deal. A snowblower chugs through it. It's when you get around freezing temps that it gets slushy and gets rough. Yeah, it gets, gets kind of thick and heavy. Well, uh, we know folks here in the Northern uh, Hemisphere, especially North America, I uh, heard from Mark earlier, it's been really cold up in Canada. And so our Canadian friends have been getting really cold Arctic air. If you're uh, listening in Australia or down south, uh, well, you're welcome. That's uh, we're, we're taking all the cold weather for you, and uh, we appreciate it. Of course, we'll post a show with world-class show notes uh, out at theaverageguy.tv. Don't forget, you can join us on our mobile app. Get easy-to-subscribe buttons out there, homegadgetgeeks.com, sponsored by LastPass and provided by Spreaker. And yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second, so hold that one uh, tight, Paul. We A um, uh, couple, couple announcements before we get started. One, Mike Weger out tonight. Congratulations, Mike. Mike had his second child uh, later, let's see, well, I guess early this week, late last week, something like that. And, uh, and so Mike, congratulations. He's out. I pinged him to say, Hey, are you coming? And he's like, Nope, I'm on baby duty tonight. So <laughs> nothing like babies to screw up podcasting, but congratulations, Mike on the newest one. And then a big thanks to Edward Weniger who joined us last week for a really in-depth and I thought a really fun Kind of cryptocurrency conversation. And so we appreciate Edward coming in. I want to thank Nathaniel as well. We did a Saturday Q&A, which I've made available on Patreon to anybody. So this isn't uh, just if you're a subscriber, if you head out to patreon.com, so that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, if you need to know, patreon.com slash the average guy. If you look at the channel, that video we did, Nathaniel and I for an hour, kind of a Q&A on crypto, kind of com community crypto. So just how does it work and and what are we thinking about? And Nathaniel asked some great tax questions and some of those kinds of things. Little extension of what we did on Thursday. So if you're into the crypto stuff, you definitely want to catch last Thursday with Edward. You definitely want to subscribe to the Patreon so that you can get the post show because we talked a bunch and speculated a bunch on the post show. Of course, that's all changed by now. So maybe not. And then you want to get Nathaniel. That's for free for everybody. Patreon.com slash the average guy. If you want to get that and it's available as a YouTube video and you can just go out there and get that. All right. Paul is wearing the shirt. So Paul, let me get the video focused on you. Cause I didn't do that. I didn't do that earlier. So 
Paul, of course, uh, got the OG Home Gadget Geek shirt when it was available. I was going to kill it tonight, but because he wore the shirt, we're going to let it go one more week. So the average guy.tv slash shirt. If you want to get that available on Amazon, um, sorry to our Canadian friends where you can't get it in Canada, available in the United States and a few other markets. So if you want to get that, uh, we will find a way, I will find a way for the meetup this fall. If you're coming from Canada, I will find a way to get a shirt uh, to you or you can order it through me, pick it up at the meetup. We'll just have it shipped to the United States and you can get it. So that is coming up as well. It will be different. This OG shirt that Paul has going off the shelf, not going to be available anymore. That design, that's the original logo. We'll come up with a new logo and a new shirt available here this spring sometime. But Paul, thanks for sporting the OG Home Gadget Geek shirt. I appreciate it. Paul Brayern is with us this evening. Paul, great to have you back. Thanks and welcome to Home Gadget Geeks. Thank you, Jim. I'm so glad to be here and I'm pretty excited about the topic tonight. This yeah, me too. This is a lot of fun. An idea we have been, this vintage tech idea. And you uh, came to mind as we were thinking, as I was kind of thinking about doing this show because you've alluded to it in all the shows that you've been with, but we've never really kind of dedicated a show to it. And so I thought, let's get Paul on and we'll just, we'll kind of see where it goes. I know you, we can see from the screen you got, it's kind of, well, first of all, kudos <laughs> for lining all that stuff up. It's pretty amazing what you got there. What, what are the years? Don't dig into it yet. Cause I want to ask you specific questions, but as you look at that gadget, what does it represent from years from when to when do you think? 1970s to late 90s, okay. I would say, most of it. So yep. 20, 20 years of tech. Why, why are you still holding on to all that stuff, Paul? Well, one of my sons is kind of interested. It's museum-like. It's fun. It's, okay. so well, it, most it's of the stuff's working well. Gadget? Yeah, yeah. A bit of history. Yeah. Do you have a special spot? Like, Do you, or do you have a gadget closet or is <laughs> there a spot where you keep all this stuff? Do you keep it boxed? Do you have the original boxes? By the way, my daughter, so my 19-year-old daughter, freshman at the nor at Northwest or at uh, um, <laughs> Northwest Missouri State. There we go. I don't know why I couldn't say that all of a sudden. But she pulled out three versions of her last phones. So we just got her a new iPhone when she was here uh, on Christmas break. She gave me her six that we're going to have to mail back in. She pulled out her original iPhone four. So the candy bar, and then she had a razor. And so she was able to pull those out with the boxes. Oh, she pulled out her iPod touch as well that I'd given her first gen iPod touch in its box as well. So my daughter, so we got one of those right there. Oh, look at that. Yeah. We'll talk about that here in just a second, but my daughter razor. had a bunch of vintage tech. That was pretty cool. I want to start, though, with a, a current gadget you're using right now, and it's very applicable because you just did some snow blowing. Yeah, pull those pull those over here. You kind of DIY'd a set of headphones that you use for both hearing protection and sound. Talk a little bit about what you did there to put that, because you, you said in the pre-show, you're like, it's better than paying for the Bose because it's not as expensive. So what have you done on that headset and explain it to, uh, to, to rig those up for us? Yeah, no, sure. Um, in the past, I was using... Oh, let's see. 3M headphones you could find at any local Sears or hardware store that were all of like $50 and they had an aux input and they had noise cancellation, but you needed your own Bluetooth module. So 50 bucks, but you could do yard work in the summer or snow blowing in the winter, not worry too much about getting them a little wet or incredibly uh, filthy in the summer. So yeah, going out with bows makes no sense in those conditions. Uh, snow blowers loud. So is my mower. Uh, I like to protect my hearing and I like to listen to podcasts. Here we go at about a hundred bucks on Amazon, solve the problem, been using these for about a year and you wouldn't know it looking at them. They're holding up nicely because they're pretty much an all metal design and they're not getting all gouged and I'm not particularly careful with them. I'll drop them from time to time. Bluetooth on, build on, the on those. Yep. Yep. So we'll throw something in the show notes right there in the, uh, on Twitter at Paul Brarin. Uh, you can see, I tweeted out uh, an article about them and there's the uh, volume up and down and a simple Bluetooth pairing. So not amazing for bass, but very good quality sound quality for podcasting. And there's your noise canceling canceling switch, which you can turn on optionally. Do you uh, see the green light? There you go. Oftentimes those are kind of designed, you know, that with the noise canceling really being an effect for like when you're on an airplane and stuff. Do you find they do a pretty good job with the mower and with the snowblower? A snowblower in particular is really loud. Do you find them pretty or they they they, they take out a lot of sound? Yeah, no, they work quite well. I wouldn't say quite as well as Bose QC35s, which are, you know, tuned for airplane engines generally and other things. Very close though. And considering the prices, you know, one half to one third, 
uh, you don't feel quite so bad about, you know, using them outdoors again. Cause I don't, I don't know. I'm hoping I get three, four years out of them. Like many of these gadgets, I think the battery will be the limiting factor when it finally dies. Yeah. Uh, but the, the ones you were using before they were just, are they not available anymore? Or did you it was a jank decide <laughs> go something different? It was a janky DIY kit, basically yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. a little Bluetooth module plugged into an aux in. They looked ridiculous. I so you had, so you had the headphones and there was an aux in on it where you, and then you kind of came out with a short little cable, right? With a Bluetooth module on the outside. And then it, did it need power as well to be able for that Bluetooth to work? How'd you, how'd you do that? Yeah. I'm going to show my desktop here, I guess, but yeah, it, it was a battery and uh, let me show it here. This um, is actually the one I'm really interested in. Cause I just thought it was a really cool set, a really cool setup. You know, not everybody, you know, can drop a hundred or even 300 and, 50 for those bows but uh i was when when i saw this um, okay i'll let it flip over to you yeah so nobody nobody made what i wanted um and I, I know people are driving or listening to this with their headphones out and about not seeing it but let me try to describe <laughs> we have an article i wrote in 2013 in frustration that nobody made something uh for around 60 dollars total is what i put together here and the funny thing is people left some comments and actually you know went and bought it and you've seen amazon affiliate links where you get some reports and you see I don't know, probably a few dozen people over the last five years actually also thought it was a good idea to spend 60 bucks, put together their own little uh, headset and here were the four parts in an Amazon shopping cart, $55, 61 cents. But you did have to plug that Bluetooth module in to charge it and you attach it with Velcro. All in all, pretty goofy solution. I mean, look at that, pretty stylish, huh? <laughs> I love it. No, that's great. That's a good look. It's but who cares if you're, for those on audio only, I mean, imagine a pair of headphones with a big Bluetooth module kind of Velcro to the side and then there's a cable coming out of it. So you'd charge the Bluetooth receiver in advance so that you'd have it, it it'd have a battery in it. And then you could, how long could you run with that uh, set of headphones on? there? Oh, probably five mowings or something before I'd be regretting not charging it before mowing and it would die in the middle. <laughs> That's always an issue with all such devices. Uh, actually, uh, here we can go back to uh, turning off my screen sharing here. There we go. Whoops. There, it's off now. And here's a little story. So here's the current headphones. These uh, Bohm, I guess you say, B-O-H-M, right? Um, there I am, Christmas morning. It snowed. I'm at 9 a.m. I, I tap to try to, there's a double tap or triple tap to skip forward 30, uh, 15 seconds in a podcast or go back in a pocket cast or I'm using uh, overcast. Anyhow, I accidentally did the key press for last number redial. Dialing a family uh, who I talked to the day before on Christmas morning, the worst possible moment while I'm out there with the snowblower. Yeah. So yes, all products have design flaws. That was a human error flaw, but I would say it is a real issue. Not having a discrete forward and reverse button to go forward and back in a podcast. I would love that. Doesn't have that. You have to remember sequences that are completely different than the Bose QC35 yeah. to drive you bunkers and do the wrong thing. So I like those 35s when you put them on and you flip that switch and it, it talks to you. It'll tell you what your battery is and if it's connected. I love those. Those are, those yeah, are nice. Yeah, Super I heard you expensive, mentioned. but they're nice. Yep. Heard you mention them on the air battery recently. Yeah. You probably hear that a little bit, but um, little I fly bit. a fair amount for my new job. I think I spent 55 nights in hotels this year. Man, uh, <laughs> cross-country flights or whatever. Just mm -hmm. you, uh, They're incredibly loud. CRJ uh, regional jets. Mm -hmm. Sitting in the back seat is where I tend to end up in a window right next to the engine. Oh my goodness. It's almost like you know, hearing protection needed, even for the um, um, the people uh, who work for the airline have got giant uh, pink ear things sticking out. So it's obvious to everyone that their own hearing is impaired because they're wearing something to protect their hearing. Yeah. So yeah, airplanes, it's kind of crazy. There's so many of the small regional jets that are allowed. So super good to have them. I, I, I really balked at paying that much. Me too. <laughs> My wife looked at me and rolled her eyes and she said, would you just go buy those stupid things? And uh Man, I, I, the first time on the aircraft and I remember taking them off, we'd been flying a while and, you know, little, it gets a little warm around your ears. And so I take them off about once every half hour and just kind of, you know, kind of cool things off, put them back on. And I took them off and I just, oh, I was like, how did I, how did I not like just want to rip my ears out in the process of not having them before? Half the weight in the bows, twice the weight in the boom. But again, mowing, don't really care. I'm fine with an hour or two of wearing them. Sure, you're going to get sweaty, but whatever. It's all vinyl. 
yeah and quite wipeable so um yeah a little quick review i don't even have an article on these i'm sorry a what i use article no, is no. still underway but no hey, I, just, people, I, wanted actually, these. I wanted to see the old ones that was the one yeah. the the real setup that was back in the day and you had that rigged i remember you tweeted about it or something you were listening to home gadget geeks and you on these things you taking a picture or whatever and i always thought well that was pretty cool that you'd rig those up i have a headphone segue we'll go to the past here yeah, um do it. i think i was like 10 years old and my parents and i would go to Times square right so you got the electronic stores so as a 10 year old uh be a little intimidating earning your allowance you got some cash in your pocket and i wanted some headphones and i'm saving up for headphones and i had a certain sennheiser i'm looking for Actually, it's probably more like age 12 at that point. Well, Times Square in that area, you're haggling for price, right? This is the, uh, uh, you and I are similar age, Jim. So this is um, 80s or so, early 80s, uh, late 70s. Yeah, early 80s. And <laughs> I remember walking out of a store for $180 getting $400 headphones. And I used them for 20 years. Guilty every freaking time I wore them. <laughs> because I was worried the guy probably got fired underselling it or he got him from an illegitimate source, right? Either way, I felt terrible. All the joy left <laughs> where using that product for the entire life of it, even though they sounded really damn good. Mm, I'd say even years you had guilt. <laughs> yep. They were wired headphones, one quarter inch phono jack. There's no, yeah. you know, Bluetooth or noise suppression. Open air, meaning a giant piece of yellow foam in your ear. But boy, do they have bass. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the, the QC35s aren't even there yet, you know, mm -hmm. for bass. They're better and they got Bluetooth built in, right? We've come a long way. Mm. Um, but yeah, I got spoiled at a young age. Shame on me, but that's what I, you know, would do with mm -hmm. dishwashing and other uh, errands and money yeah. and whatever. And, in and in 1980, similar, I have a similar story in 1980 uh, for Christmas. I think it was 80, 79, 80. My brother, my parents got me up. I, I just gotten my first stereo. And so um, uh, they had to be, yeah, 80, 81. And so they, for Christmas, they got me over the year, you know, big pair of cans it sounded just awesome. And I think it was one of the few presents I got that year. And I remember plugging it in and turning that up and just thinking, this is the bomb. And then about an hour later, my mom came in, Hey, can you not sing so loud? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, you just, you start singing along, you can't hear yourself. They were the great, but I, I had those things for years. I think when I went in the military, I lost them. Um, but that was, uh, you know, those days that was with the exception of a Walkman, right? You would have the little tiny headphones for the Walkmans that had come out the same year. It was so cool to have these big pair of cans that you would, uh, that you'd listen to stuff through. So that was, uh, and I had no guilt, but, uh, I love my, <laughs> I, I love my over the ear headphones. Yeah. And if you have a roommate or something, you don't want foam earphones where the other people in the room can hear it. You need a closed ear design. Just point that out to folks. Yeah, no, so, right on those. It's what's funny. Those, those. Um, over the ear really make us, they, they surge for a while and they get real popular and then we go back to earbuds and it seems like they've gone back and forth and it's hilarious. I've actually seen with those bows, maybe not the 35s, but I've seen people working out with big, you know, with these big over the ear headphones on. And I'm like, I'm not sure I would want to be working out and sweating with a, you know, with a pair of vinyl headphones on, but I'm seeing more in like the bows. Uh, headphones. I'm seeing more and more people work out with those. Paul, would you, would you go, would you work out with these kinds of earbuds or would you take a pair of cans and, and put them on? Yeah, no, earbuds probably because they got the gummy ear. Everything else falls out of my ears. Anything hard plastic just fall right out. Um, You know, earbuds. Uh, here we got the, what is it, Audio Technica ATR 2005? Yeah. I don't know. You recommended yep. it. There's a silver version too, yep. USB attached. Yep. But the, audio in from the earbuds in and now I'm good for sound with, you know, no echo, not less. Uh, noise in the room, although you can hear some ambient noise with this kind of microphone design. But anyhow, these earbuds are popular. I see you wear your earbuds. Are you wearing them today? You, oh, don't yeah, have, yeah. you have the red ones in? Or? No, you, I went black to black too, make yep. them a little more conspicuous. Yep. And then there I was uh, two weeks ago, um, Ryan Shrout's studio in Cincinnati. I happened to be in the area. Uh, it was awesome to visit another tour. He's one of the Leo Laporte um, podcaster people. I've been to Petaluma before. And there he was wearing earbuds just like you, Jim. In the studio okay. every week in his podcast, he's got bright red earbuds. Yeah, because yeah. again, that gummy factor, the the rubber they use, it actually holds it. Well, they 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 can be in yours for a long time. I can't do hours of over the ear uh, headphones anymore. Even when I'm wearing, when I'm flying, I got to take those things off from time to time just to let my ears kind of rest. But yeah, no, the earbuds work well, and they're kind of designed for for lengths of time. Hey, Drashna was messaging in the chat. He sees your keyboard there. 
Can you, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that, that one down there. Can you, can you bring that up a little quick uh, and kind of show that on camera? What do you got there? All right. So Drashna, I'm going to quiz you here. If this is a micro channel computer from the eighties, what connector do you think this coily cord is going to on this clicky IBM classic keyboard? That's not PS2. That's for sure. Well, <laughs> or mm, it so it is smaller. Yeah. So the arrival of this guy was the first 2.5 inch oh. floppies. And the first time you had a smaller connector with the still excellent giant keyboard that's missing a cap, greatly reducing its value on eBay. But you get the idea. And there was a weird uh, proprietary connector here that actually comes out as well. Yeah. So this is, that, is that, uh, that's not a PS2 connector, just a smaller DIN. Actually, or. I is believe it, it is. PS2. Yeah. Okay. It's got the little the little keyed. Um, yeah, I guess it is. I would have four, expected four the pins. five pin DIN, the big, yep. the big, uh, the big one. That 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 one was. We saw a lot of those when I worked for Computer Renaissance. This is me in college. So this is eighty seven first PS two. Uh, this sucker was expensive. Um, again, saving some of my high school dollars to go off to college and get this PS two model fifty to horse around. Uh, with Windows in the early DOS and Windows days, like Windows 1.0 and 1.1, whatever they called it, but way before Windows Workgroups, Microsoft called me in my dorm room, asked me what I thought of Windows and what I use it for. They had no idea it was a college really Microsoft calling you. It not. was actually Microsoft calling me, not the today where it never is. <laughs> oh, I've wanted to set up a honeypot and record those calls. They're so bad. Yeah. You've, your laptops. Your was that about five exactly. grand, do you think, for that? Uh, two and a half, I think. Okay. I don't think I had the max memory and the snazziest hard drive, which got me into upgrading. I've got to stick around the front. And uh, so, yeah, anyhow, we covered the keyboard tremendously quickly. Imagine this for a podcast studio. Not such a good choice. Oh, yeah, I know. But, gr- but great gaming keyboard. I am. Um, so when I worked at Computer Renaissance, uh, we had somebody bring one of those in. Not that year, but, but still a, a PS2. And uh, I, I was, br- I was kind of new to PCs, and I took the thing apart, thinking it was a PC, and you could just put any memory in there and stuff. And of course, it, the whole thing is proprietary, right? And so I ended up messing up the P- the uh, the computer really bad, and we had to replace it uh, with another one because we couldn't get it working again. It was I messed it up so bad. So I avoided from then on. I avoided IBM computers. Look, look at those. Look at that. I have not taken the lid off this thing in probably 15 years. There's my 20 megabyte hard drive in the middle. So we've jumped to 1987. Sorry, we skipped past the 70s. We're, we're going to back to that a little bit. We're going to yep. skip. And uh, wow, I've got some giant micro channel card in there. I'm in a little trouble remembering what it was. I've got power a supply game. right there on the left, right? Anyone know what this is? Come on, chat room. Oh, this is a 30 second delay. Let's see. That's 15 pins, I believe. That's my hint right there. 15 pins. Someone out there should know what that is. 15 pins. I see VGA and, on there, but what is that? I don't know what that is. All right, let's give them a few more. We'll give them a second. Uh, we'll give them a second. Hey, is that the power supply on the left there? Is that? Sure is. And, and how big? What's the wattage on that thing? An excellent Josh question. Scuzzy or MIDI? That right was, here. Yeah. IBM clearly labels it output wattage 94 watts. Right there, my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! And it's tested by uh, no one's name. All right, but someone's got their handwriting on a tested by sticker. So computers ridiculously well made and large amounts of metal. This very thick plastic backing that is very rigid. Uh, thumb screws. Notice tool free. I opened it up, and you know, shock dampers and all kinds of over engineered metal parts inside. Not terribly recyclable, but giant thumb uh, parts for uh, removing microchannel, you know, tool free again. So microchannel has some good parts and some horrible parts. Here I'm looking at my CPU. It's been upgraded to a Kingston SX33 GAM. Uh, and then remember you could buy um, co-processors, right? Optionally to speed yeah, up. Yeah, you could. 386, right? No, yep. so that's a two, is that 286? This is a 286 right 286. there. And I have not booted in a while. Uh, Flight Simulator was the ultimate test of compatibility. Who knows? It might still boot. I bet. I doubt it. Oh, yeah, I don't know. That's a lot older than. Well, do you have a power older. The question is, do you have a plug that fits it, or is it still the old school? What what power? S- yeah, standard. Yeah, Th- same nope. thing. So that hasn't changed. All right. So the guesses on that were SCSI or MIDI or a parallel port. Maybe. Drashna wins. Joystick. All right. There you go. No Which other gyms. Other gyms. Joystick. Yeah. Oh, okay. You say it first. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Joystick. Thank you. Yeah. All right. 
So, uh, okay, we'll go back to the 70s. So, Jim, we're both around half a hundred, right? We're at the same age. We're close. We yes. Are. So, yeah. 60s. Uh, yep. yep. Um, and my name, Paul, kind of gives that away. But anyhow, over on the left, Caldors and Ames, that might be chains people in the Northeast, might remember. They're from Rocky Hill, Connecticut, the next town over. Both are now long gone. But I used to ride my bike to Caldors as a, uh, let's see, what age? I don't know. Eight, maybe? Let's see if I can find a date on this one. Here is... A uh, fluorescent screen. See if I can get this thing to turn on. It'd be fun if someone actually remembers it and you'll hear. There we go. Uh oh, dear. A little malfunction. See if we can hit reset. Oh, no. <laughs> Ta da! It's working. Woohoo! All right. Awesome. This, this is the tech of the time. You move left and right. You fight your opponent by shooting a oh, my God, bullet a diagonally. Tiny screen. Okay, that's your video gaming of the late 70s. Uh, there's no date on it. I have to do a quick I'm going to say 76. So mini vid, Dodge City. Paul's like a you know 10 year old something like that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I would actually go to the Caldors to play this because they'd have the games out where you could actually use them back then. Electronics, mm. you used them before you bought them. Kind of a big deal when you're using your allowance for it. Did you? And you buy that new? I did. Yeah, that was. How much um, do you think it was in in the 70s, middle 70s? How much do you think that was new? That was from Ames at an end cap. I can remember that. I re remember ridiculous things. Um, 50 or 45 bucks, somewhere in there. This was, sucked. A, ton. This was a lot. This thing was like 65. What do, you, what do you got there? Space Invaders does not work. I tried it before the show because guess what? The classic move when I opened this, a bunch of crud fell out. You know, oh, that, uh, the batteries, the batteries left in there. there. Yeah. yeah. You could probably clean that up though. And make Agreed. It, make it work again. Yep. It worked as little as five years ago. So probably works, but. Yep, display is a little more sophisticated here. You have a whole bunch of uh, illuminated elements, uh, probably like 40 different space invaders, but obviously not really animation, jumpy, but you get the idea. Do I have a year on that? 1980. All right, so there you go. Nowhere near arcade quality games starting to show up that you could actually sort of afford in your home and actually had a joystick, making it a whole lot of fun. So yeah. it's quite a good little- I've never concept. seen that. I've never seen that one before. Ah, okay. Yeah, so invaders from space. So I, you know, ride my bike to Caldors and spend like four hours before I finally bought the thing. <laughs> um, all right. So that's. I could see you in there oh checking God. out all the stuff and playing it and you'd, you'd be checking all the details and you probably had all, you knew all the specs going in. I'm just going to say. Of hmm, these games. Hardware, hardware specs. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know as far as nerdy. Think? Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. Um, no, you wouldn't. Well, magazines. Remember. Some of the magazines, the mad magazines or, or even the computer magazines would have ads in the back that had all this stuff in them. Yeah. When did Byte Magazine arrive? I'm thinking about a TI calculator in the late uh, 70s, right? So you remember fancy calculators. You could go to a store oh, yeah. and see a whole case full of them. And they were 40, 50 bucks. So in today's dollars, pretty darn pricey, 150, mm -hmm. 200, something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you really knew the CPU or RAM. I guess I started nerding out about the specs. So Let's go to 77, was it? Was that the year, the, the most amazing Christmas uh, ever with the Atari console? Do I have it right? Mm. A 600 console. Uh, when did that come out? So that Christmas, just unbelievable. 1977 release, September. I got it for under the Christmas tree three months later. All right. Uh, you had what some happened? Good parents, Paul. I'm just going to uh, say, you had some good parents. Uh, indeed. Are, I they, did. are they still with us today? They are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah 80s. Tell them. Tell them that Jim said they were some good parents. <laughs> uh thank you jim i appreciate that um and your stories of uh well coming full circle you were talking about going to germany right in your background there i yeah. wanted to get back there since i was 11 my family's from germany it finally went with my mom so you talking on the air about going to germany really got me thinking i want to do that good, good. i'm so glad that happened um back to the 70s as yeah. we're a little kid it's i'm atari, 10 years right i'm about 10 years old the atari comes out a year later i'm now convincing my mom uh I need the basic module for my Atari 2600 console. It, an excuse for spending more money, but also had a membrane keyboard to actually do some basic programming. Mm. So I don't know if anyone out there heard of that. Uh, let's, I don't know. We'll see. We got people talking about Donkey Kong and Nintendo. All right. So anyhow, 78-ish, I'm trying programming. Not so great at it. A uh, basic thing was a uh, flight simulator. I'm trying to make a line that moves in response to the joystick. That's a horizon for flight simulator, right? And I'm realizing, eh, maybe my strength is not really programming. <laughs> so it takes me so many hours to get that. Or maybe I need a Commodore VIC-20 that I then saved up money for. And, and I remember buying the 12-inch monitor, which I think I still might have. 
but I sold the Commodore VIC-20. I wish oh. I didn't, right? And the 2600 is long gone too, right? I needed that money. I became a teenager, needed the money for a car, and that stuff just goes away. You sell it, right? So, oh, well. Um, isn't it funny? But hold, but before we move on, isn't it funny? And, and I think most of the audience listening can relate to this. There's a weird, when, when you have stuff, it, there's there's a time where it's really useful. And then it becomes, it sits on the desk and collects dust or whatever. And then it becomes a nuisance, right? And it's that nuisance period when we're most likely to toss it, sell it. Um, I, I think sometimes it's getting harder and harder. The, the time frame is moving up on when you have to sell things now. Like, you know, you used to maybe get three or four years. And now I think maybe you get 18 months or maybe two years before something completely becomes unsellable. Now, that kind of depends what it is. And electronics, especially computer equipment, is living a little bit longer uh, these days than it used to. But there's that nuisance window in there where we all were like, oh, this is, I'm never going to need this again. I can, you know, you sold it to get a car because a car was more important. And then we always wish. Then it, there's, a, there's a period, maybe it's 15, 20 years when you're like, oh, why did I let that go? You know? And so I've been thinking about that nuisance period a lot, especially over the last five years of whenever I'm getting going to get rid of something, I think, now, wait a minute. Is, am I in the nuisance period? Do I just need to hold on and box it and put it somewhere? I mean, I, I've got some equipment, including this RT that's sitting in front of me, this Windows RT tablet that I keep thinking. All I use it for is the weather, but it stays plugged in. I keep using it. And I'm kind of thinking, when will the when will that become a nuisance and will I, will, will that be one of those things that I keep and I am on a show like you are 20 years from now and I'm like, look, these tablets we used to have, you know? So I'm, I'm always interested in that. Like there's that weird period. I'm, you broke the mold on a lot of this because you kept some of it, but not everybody does. A lot of people, especially phones and stuff, you know, we get to that period. Like I've, I've got my wife's got an old Blackberry still sitting in a drawer up here. And I keep thinking, we just need to chuck that thing. And then you think, no, we're going to want to talk about it. So anyways, um, that nuisance period is always when we start throwing stuff away, you know? Yeah, no, early. Oh, oh, Jim, it's not auto switching to you when you're talking, by the way. So, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we no, want to I see it on, No, I know I put it on you. So, cause you were showing stuff, but I'll, I'll switch it back. Now I'll switch it back to you. What else do you got for us? What do you want to show? All right. So, uh, and earlier you asked me, I don't think I answered you. I do have like a glass cabinet, uh, in a bedroom that holds on to this, like a mini museum. It doesn't take up much room in the house, right? We got two square feet of carpet space in a vertical cabinet. It's not a huge burden on, you know, to keep it. Um, these are mostly small things, right? The big things mostly went away long ago. All right, so 70s, we covered a little bit of gaming. Um, another type of display, because, uh, you know, there's people maybe quite a bit younger who might not have ever seen something like this, but this is LCDs. You're starting to get watches come out that have LCD displays, so there's power savings. Instead of a bright illuminated LED, you have LCDs coming out. And they haven't really changed much in 30, 40 years. The contrast is not amazing. It's not a pure white background. It's kind of grayish. But you can play a pretty good Donkey Kong on two different screens here. And uh, actually, I haven't tested this thing lately. There's no batteries in it now. But I believe this thing might still work. And uh, not sure the year on that one. Would have to look it up. OK, so I've covered 83, I'm going to say on that one, I think. 82, oh, 83, are. don't you think? I was I was thinking, like, when did I play these games? Because I never had them. My parents, we never had the money to buy these things, and so I never got them. But all my friends did. I lived in South San Jose and went to a school that had some money. So I ended up enjoying all this technology, including, you know, Nintendo. I think, it, what, which one was the football? Did you ever play the football game? The mm. Was it Coleco, or was it, I forget who made that, but... I played hours of my buddies. My friend, Matt McCoy was his name, his football game. Cause I could never get one. That might've been mid seventies. And, uh, uh, yeah, a, wealth, a wealthy friend of the family's kid had one of those. I never forgot it. And, uh, you know, coveted it. Yeah. <laughs> Not the greatest yeah. feeling, but you know, oh, right. Right. there was it patterns. Was you could do. It was expensive with, with the football game. There were patterns you could do that. You would always, you could always score. Is it white and green? The thing you're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking yeah, about. And you can get them now for like 25 bucks on Amazon. Like they're, oh, wow. you know, they have rep replicas of them. I think 25, 50 bucks, something like that. My backlight is kind of cooperating. Let's see. Now, what do you this, have there? Uh, there's a car. Ooh. It's not an it's not an LED or LCD. It's a mechanical device with a a ribbon of road running, and you just avoid the cars colliding. This is plain old filament bulbs running this game system, and this is What's from the name of it. Tomy 1978 Digital Derby. Auto Raceway. So it'd be fun if... Uh, it, does it work? 
Uh, didn't seem to have C batteries around the house that were charged. So when I tried it, nothing happened. So I don't know. Um, what about yeah, those games fun. that needed D, C, and D batteries? And they were pretty. They were fairly expensive, and they would just blur, they'd burn through them. You know yeah, exactly. And uh, we're, let's mm -hmm. check it out. John Biggs answers. Nineteen seventy eight is the football game. Oh, Thank okay. you, John Biggs. We're having a fun time on the. Yeah. I played that a lot. I just, I, in fact, we bought a replica version of it, I think years ago, a couple of years ago. And I played a bunch of it for, I don't know, maybe a day. And then I'm like, okay, I'm over this. <laughs> this is not that good. <laughs> you know, it was good in its time, but then you're like, eh, it's not that good. I'm not going to play it as many hours as I used to play it when I was a kid, for sure. Frodo confirms 1978 for a digital derby. That was like, uh, and then we have Mark Robson who remember the racing game. There you go. Other people have seen this, this stuff, Jim. This oh yeah. It's good cool. stuff. All right, now I'm going to keep trying to describe stuff for audio listeners, but now we've covered LCD, LED, late 70s, and even a membrane, a uh, little belt. Think of a, a, a um, what do you call it? A treadmill game, basically, where a racing track is going around and you're avoiding cars. Uh, let's get um, the other tech from the late 70s out here. Let's see. Okay, mo 80s. So we moved well into the 80s and 90s now. Um, yeah, that one would be late. That would be almost, that'd be middle go. 90s, wouldn't it? Early 90s. Let's go back to Kodak, Rochester Revolution I, I, at IBM and now at, um, at VMware. There's many customers of big companies in Rochester, New York, right? And I've uh, been there many times. So every time I see the hulking Kodak buildings, I think of my dad and his high eight. And this is, I think, regular eight and no audio. So this is probably 70s tech here. Brownie cameras along with stuff like this became affordable for the masses. They really changed the world with this stuff. Super eight. So your dad you, could take three, three minute movies. Home did movies. you guys as a family sit around? Would you, would you get them, you know, you get the film developed and then you, Oh yeah. On a projector. Would you sit around and play it? My dad had to pull down screen in the basement when they finished it off and got out the projector and it was family time for three glorious minutes. You got to see, you know, your big brother playing soccer and uh, you on there for 20 seconds, you know, is, Brief clips and very expensive for the film. When my dad passed away, um, somehow we in I inherited some you know, some, some slides, and I, I don't know why I'm I think I'm supposed to get these digitally taken care of. I haven't done it yet, but oh uh, yes, yeah, you know, remember this? And we we yep. sit around. I mean, I, I went. I was in a youth group, so this has been early '80s. The guy, uh, the leader, the director of the youth group, he took everything in slides, and he had these. He had closets full of all the slides and the reels, and they were categorized. And you know, you know, hey, this was the backpack trip of, you know, nineteen ninety or nineteen eighty one. And this was, and he had, we just go over his house and uh, we do these, watch these slideshows, and we would, you know, we'd look at these things for hours. This was, this was pretty crazy. In fact, this might be me. That's awesome. Um, my dad got me into photography, so let's. This is 1983. So slides were big then, Jim. You're holding up a negative or a slide, a slide that's oh, in the correct a color, slide. right? Yep, yeah, a slide. slide. Yep. You bet. And negatives didn't have that plastic or a, a paper or cardboard uh, carrier that Jim just showed. Mm -hmm. All right. So 1983 is me around age 16 getting a Nikon FE2. This was a big deal. Uh, graduation gift. I think might have chipped in or bought the lens. You know, you're getting a theme here where you kind of helped pay for the stuff we got in our, and you tended to value it and take better care of it. This worked up until like two, three years. So here's a SLR uh, camera that actually has a shutter and we can look inside yeah. and you'll see a mechanical uh, mirror that moves out of the way when you take a picture. Um, looks like the shutter is closed. You're not quite seeing things, but yeah, you could remove the lens easily. And I ended up being a photographer from a daily newspaper when I went off to college. I quite enjoyed photography and I have not had a real SLR ever since I really gave this up in my maybe uh, um, my late twenties with a what, growing, growing family that hobby kind of yeah this is nineteen eighty three and I kind of gave that hobby up as I started having a family in the early yeah. 80s. so in eighty five I got a Canon T fifty uh, as a gift as a Christmas gift from from a gal, gal I was dating to take to Europe and I shot tons of pictures with that with that T fifty. Uh, shot tons of film. I brought it back. We took a lot of family pictures. And so it actually made the conversion from analog to digital. And remember, we used to send pictures off for, you know, you take them by a photo, you know, a photo booth. That wasn't what it was called, but, a, you know, there'd be this kiosk in the middle of the, of the parking lot. You drop off your film and you could go pick it up later. And, um, and then 
a Snapfish came along, right? We had Snapfish, and there's a couple other ones. And you would send, you would mail your, you'd mail your photos in, and then you would, um, you, they'd come back in the mail, and you, then they started providing CDs or or digital copies of them. Uh, and then of course uh, that that all went online. So, but it was an interesting transition. I used that Canon T50 all the way through till oh, I gave it I gave it away to somebody to use for a couple of years and got it back. And I still might have that T50 around here. I wonder how I'd even get film for it anymore if I wanted to try and use it again. And you'd have to, I mean, the chemical process of of processing those films was awful. I mean, it there was a lot of cancer caused by those pictures. <laughs> Yeah. Well, my, my dad had a dark room in the basement. My older brother helped him make it, soundproofing it, uh, lightproofing it, uh, a fan to suck out the noxious fumes you just uh, alluded to there. Yeah. And I got to do actual black and white photography as a kid. Wow. I ended up doing that in the daily newspaper in college. Yeah. That was fun. You had to get that photo right. It was chemicals. And uh, if you overexposed it or underexposed it, there's no going back. It's a daily newspaper. Either you blew it or you got the photo. So you'd be doing dodge and burn and all that stuff. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, by the way, also in the 80s, High eights coming along with sound. This camera didn't get used as much. Most of my dad's high eight stuff, I call it high, I just said the wrong thing. Super eight is the word I was looking for. Super eight with no audio is a three minute that was champion. This one with audio, the darn media was pretty expensive. So it didn't get used nearly. Was it in much. a cartridge? Was the media for that in a cartridge? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's your compartment for your. Yeah, for your Super 8, which um, I think might still be in this camera. Yeah, the High 8 was soundless, right? That's what you said? Yeah, sorry. High 8 is digital and later. I misspoke. It's called Super 8. It is the 8mm oh, okay. format I was talking about there. Yeah. Let's see if I can open up this Kodak. Yeah, maybe not. All right. Well, it looks like there might be film in this, but... Uh, oh, I wonder what's in there. <laughs> well if i open it I, if i open it i destroy it oh, how about i yeah, no, you gotta finish it up and although it'll probably cost you a hundred dollars to get it developed exactly who the heck yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah all right so um jim that's a good segue to early late 80s early 90s yeah, camcorder so hi right that's the word i kept misusing so hi it is digital so when you get sony coming in with height format um what was interesting about it and this could be the start of my um, well, part of storing data and digital data. Let's talk about that. So um, remember I mentioned a Commodore VIC-20? I kind of skipped over that. That was the cheap one before the Commodore 64, which is way more popular and way more expensive. Commodore VIC-20 had a cassette drive, right? If you spent hours, like there was a magazine called um, Gaming Magazine, I believe, and you had six or eight pages of peek and poke commands, just pure coding, learning to touch type as a 14 or 15-year-old. It was awesome. Um, I also took a typing class my mom made me go to. Glad I did. Um, now I'm typing in someone else's programming. I'm basically making a game for myself, right? Someone else authored it and wrote it in words. I get to type it in. Now I save it on cassette. But the cassette deck didn't always work. That miserable, wretched feeling of losing hours of your life, and it's just so much less fun to do it again, it kind of got me to risk reduction my whole IT career, the last you know 25 or some odd years of doing stuff so you don't have that boneheaded oops ouch feeling because you just didn't think something through and you lost your data um so i tell you that story in a Commodore vic 20 with cassettes which were ridiculous media because this isn't really any different it's high eight media also a cassette like cartridge uh, i've got one around here somewhere right here and the uh erasable label idea was me where you used an alcohol wipe and you could reuse the label and reuse the tape because they were pretty expensive Mm -hmm. So that one just fell off because all the goo is gone. But there you go, high eight media, and you're literally talking about tape. But here is the thing that was special about Sony, and there it is, protected. There you go. You're seeing the tape naked as I open up that little locking mechanism. Uh, what's special about it is, anyone, a little pop quiz for the audience here? I'm not going to wait 30 seconds for the buffer, though. Uh, how did you get from height to your computer? How did you do video editing in these days? What was special about Sony and what kind of interface did they have on the early camcorders? And I'm actually looking for where that connector is and struggling to find it. It's been a few years since I've used this device. Um, I want to show it on think camera. About, while you're looking for it, think about the technology. Today, we take all that for granted. But when that, mm -hmm. came, when that thing came out, I mean, it was a marvel in all the different ports and all the different connectors and the lens and... 
I mean, it really brought, I, I bet millions of those tapes were sold uh, as people took everybody. I shouldn't say everybody, but tons of people. If you travel, they'd have that, that, that style camcorder. It really kind of set the pace for what camcorders would become. There we go. RCA. Yeah, correct. And here's the replaceable battery. You could charge it and keep going on the move, or you could put on a power supply and keep recording on a tripod. Link was a video protocol where you could pause and remotely over a serial to link cable. Um, this particular camcorder looks like it does not have the interface I was talking about. And what it is is Firewire. So if you have Firewire, you can dump each two hour high tapes. We've moved from three minutes to two hours, right? From my dad's vintage to late 80s, early 90s here. About a thousand bucks for these things. We're not cheap. Um, and now you've got 26 gig AVI file on your Windows PC. What the heck do you do with that? That was huge back then. Your hard drives were tiny. Uh, so it was great because it was lossless. You didn't have static. You didn't have snow. You didn't have those artifacts of VHS of the day. You had digital height from Sony. And that was a game changer because now you could put it over Firewire and actually maybe save it. And that was a huge project when my uh, now oldest son uh, was younger. He really helped me out by feeding a camcorder all summer and getting 140 tapes digitized. Where I now realized, oh my goodness, I got to go to MP4 and and deal with three terabytes of data that have been backing up and maintaining ever since. Yeah, It's, so you what, know, family growing up video stuff. So Prices. does that have fire, Firewire on it? Or how did you get, what's the, what was the answer? How do you get, what's There's the another the camcorder? Connection? I grabbed the wrong one and there oh. was Firewire on it. Yep. Okay. So right. I had to have a Firewire adapter in my PC and some, uh, the Windows built-in software could actually kind of rip it, basically doing the digital bit transfer in real time. You push play, two hours later, you had a 26 gig AVF file that you could turn into a seven gig MP4. And pre, At the time, pre USB, right? Uh, let's uh, Firewire see. Firewire pre, pre uh, we, USB or just barely, but USB was too before. slow. I think we had USB yeah. one one probably coming out at the time. Yeah. All right. So, so folks there in the '90s, you know, your kids growing up, you know, it's priceless. You want it digital. You don't want it to get old if it's ten or twenty years later playing it back. And Firewire gave me that with uh, my kids born in the '90s, where that was became possible. And that's cool. And that starts kind of the digital story, the digital era here. I, I wonder right. how many of those. Paul, while you transition, I wonder how many of those videos were lost. You know, all that video was shot on those, but it took some oh, yeah. effort to get it off. It's not like today where I'll just email, you know, I'm going to email the, the video. You, uh, you really took some effort. And I just wonder how many family videos got stuck on tape that, especially that right. kind of tape that never, never saw the light of day again. I bet it was a lot. Oh. Or if it's in your basement, one little flood will take it all out. If it's anywhere yeah. near the ground, so many oh, things happen to people's time. homes. Yeah. Um, and and money. If you pay someone to digitize it, oh my gosh, it's a lot of labor. It's two hours of real time playback for each of tape, 130 tapes. My goodness, what that would cost to pay any kind of Photoshop to do that, yeah. right? Well, so you're probably right. A majority of this stuff's probably lost forever for most. We of still have that nuisance. Remember, I talked about that nuisance period when we think about technology. There is that period where you it becomes impossible with some of this technology. You've got it. There's a period where it's the technology is not being used anymore, but it's still possible to get it off. And then you just, it's gone. The adapters aren't there anymore. The protocols don't work. You just physically can't do it anymore. And I mean, think of some of your old phones. There's stuff on there that you just can't get off anymore. It just doesn't, just doesn't work, you know? Well, ke chemicals, we've got something on this. Yeah. Super eight, but I might not ever know because it's no, Rochester you'd have to find Kodak a processing place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right on. We're probably lost forever. Right That's on. analog. It's, it, is analog. Lesson, it is a lesson, though. It is a lesson to us, though. If we got this media, like get it done before that period starts, because it does happen. Where the technology, you, you know, I, I keep thinking there'll be a day when we won't know how to do anything with DVDs. You know, it'll yep. be like they, they, there won't be DVD players to play them anymore, and it'll be like and the tape and the. Uh, the DVDs themselves will have lost the reflective coating and it will stop working. So there, it's just a good reminder. There are, you know, this stuff is only good for a while. Get it converted. Yeah. And uh, you know what, before I move on to audio and uh, phones, let's wrap up video. So go forward to today and you got an iPhone 10 that can do 4k video at 60 frames a second. The data, the, the amount of data that represents. Um, so one of my sons and my parents, we've recorded some, you know, legacy video asking about their life, their time in, uh, U.S. Army serving in Germany, um, and cool stories all about their life, right? Capturing it. It's um, coming up on maybe 10 hours of raw 4K footage. Oh my goodness, what a project. <laughs> so I told you the other story of uh, three terabytes of 140 some odd tapes or something for a uh, height. And now I've got about 10 hours of valuable footage of my you know, parents um, around 80 years old. And uh, yeah, important to keep that too. Then it becomes how the heck do we share this uh, with family who don't have, you know, Blu-ray, Blu-ray, 
playback. Uh, it's too much data, right? You got to recompress it and do something with it. So the story lives on. And I guess I got the bug to try to be an archivist sort of for the family over a decade ago was it Windows Home Server was showing up, right? And you could do dry pooling and get three drives together uh, because I needed to back up all these fire uh, firewire transfers of 26 gig files. How would I do it? That's when the bug sort of started with joining drives together and then making a RAID array and then backing up to a second source. That's a decade ago. And that became my current job at VMware where that's my focus is uh, vSAN, which is basically the same idea, tying a bunch of drives together for the enterprise in an affordable, uh, logical way. So yeah, there's these common threads, Jim. <laughs> a lot of the people listening to this podcast, you know, think the same way. You hate oh, yeah. that miserable feeling of losing something forever. The irreplaceable stuff. No, it's just sure. a lousy feeling. It happens to everybody. All right. So that's the video story. Um, but it is incredible what a phone can do now. Yeah, an iPhone 10 is a thousand dollar plus device, but my goodness, the image stabilization is quite good. Better than this camcorder's mechanical OIS where it had liquid crystal uh two. Lenses that literally had squishy uh, gel between them and would mechanically move to counteract your jiggly motion as you zoomed in and had a shaky hand. You go to an iPhone 10 today and it blows the doors off of performance, right? I think it's um, cheaper. I, it, yep. it's, yeah, it's a thousand oh, to a thousand, but a thousand dollars in 1980. 20 years, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a lot. Yep, so you can whine about your thousand dollar phone, but you know what, they're pretty incredible what we can do. Yeah, pretty amazing. All right, so analog digital uh let's see what the heck year are we with a phone that looks like this where you got an analog pull out um i'm gonna say 92. that's around when i'm doing os2 trainings driving to buffalo from connecticut need to be yeah. safe on the new york thruway eight hour drive from home your car might die you ended up having something like this it wasn't really a business tool it was mostly a safety tool mm -hmm. right uh so that's the early days um and this is bell atlantic 9x mobile so I think that's my first cell phone. You'd hang up by popping the earpiece down. People watching might just giggle at that. It's ridiculous, but whatever. It's not a flip phone. And the antenna is absurd. You know, brain cancer times. So they would know, always break off. You don't want it in your pocket. Analog signals, the thing would be pretty warm. Who knows what the radiation is doing. That We've come a long way from the amount of milliwatts this thing used and how few hours it would last. In its I, like your, I like your optimism on that, Paul. That's, that's pretty funny. Um, the, how bad they, how were, uh, we had the very first one we had was one of those, those real classic flip. They were giving them away for free with the service, you know, and you would just like this and it was, you know, it was like the old Star Trek thing. So that was our very first flip phone. Yep. So, uh, I don't know, Jim, when we're podcasting in our eighties together, 30 years from now, we'll be like, uh, so do you have cancer of your right thigh or, you know, who yeah. knows, right? Uh, who knows? Early days. Of the I think the matrix, the movie, the matrix has a version of that where they, you know, when they, they would click it and the, the phone would kind of extend out like that. Um, not that phone, but very similar to it. Oh, I yeah. Like I remember those. I had one of those. That was my first work phone. 95, I joined IBM. Four people on the team had this, including the hip holsters for the true nerds that run around the data center. So, yep, we're looking at a Motorola StarTech. Again, I got to remember the audio listener. And does the, the antenna, band, you still have the antenna or did it break off? It broke off long ago. You could replace it. It was just screw in threaded if you got yourself another one. And there was a pretty good uh, aftermarket and eBay started coming alive. What was it late, very late nineties maybe? Is that when eBay started? So yeah. you could actually get parts for stuff like this, right? And keep it running a little longer. Put that in your so, pocket. So Battery yep. on the top. Yep. yep. Oh man, StarTech. I bet. Pull that battery right off. And look how thin it is. That's gotta be the first consumer mainstream. There were so many of those sold. Agreed. And look at the size, you know, not bad, right? Let's have a little fun and uh, I'd be careful what's on my screen here. Face ID. <laughs> All right. There's an iPhone 10. There's a Motorola StarTech. Um, it's a pretty small device, right? Yeah, the old StarTech. <laughs> we, we, um, that was the very first one I could justify for work. And so I remember the day I was doing mortgage loans at the time. This would have been 96. And that those were getting super cheap. And that was my very first business phone. And I remember coming home and telling Sarah, I went ahead and went ahead and bought a phone for work. And, uh, I, I think I got maybe six. No, it'd have to be more than that. Maybe two hours of talk time a month or something in it. I mean, it was a pretty expensive plan. You didn't get a lot of time. They were kind of designed, you know, you kind of got on them and got off of them. They, you weren't talking a long time on your cell phone. Totally agree. Uh, six. Yeah. Um, Here's uh, Frodo says January 3rd, 96 for the StarTac. So yeah, it would have been 96, 95, 96. 
Actually, I have a story. Let's see. Second kid. Uh, do we have cell phones yet? I don't know. I think mid nineties pagers were a thing, right? Mm -hmm. You had a pager and, um, I was in a, let's see, grad school working in a basement. The only thing that would work is a pager and baby on the way. Uh, you need to know when that's going to happen. I literally just walk around the pager. Um, two years later, I'm in Connecticut where Waterbury, Connecticut is the home of Timex. I'm walking around, um, I don't know, Target or something. So it's probably 10, 15 years later. Pagers were still a thing. Someone from Timex walks up to me, seeing my nerdy Casio phone or whatever the heck I had at the uh, Casio watch at the time. He says, hey, you want to... Um, prototype test a pager built into a watch. I'm like, sure. You sign a non-disclosure, you send you some gear, you give some feedback on the phone to the, the crew there in Waterbury, Connecticut, making Timex watches that were also pagers. Fun little story for you. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous now, but it was very reliable. Doctors using it, right? If something serious is happening, you need to reach someone, those pagers could penetrate a deep, dark bunker even when you're in a data center. There was darn good reasons for carrying those. They blew the doors off of cell phones for many, many years. Yeah. So there you go. When do you think, when did, when did, so, when did pagers go away? What do you think? 2000, hmm. middle to early 2000, where pagers really became obsolete. You know, we don't get smartphones till middle 2000s for the most part, right? Nine, 2007 or something. Do you think pagers are good right up until mid, mid 2005, 2006, do you think? Or later? Uh, I think about my job. I dropped mine and there was no IBM reimbursement, probably starting in 2000, somewhere around there. But sure, people probably had them for a few more years, yeah. especially in hospitals, I think. On-call doctors, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. Um, here we go. Here's the phone. Now we've got an LCD on the side panel. Don't know what this is called. This is a uh, Verizon branded, clearly Motorola product. Yep. Motorola. Is that the Razor? Yeah, it must be. Or is it I called Crazer? Wait a minute. Crazer's later. Okay. So you got Razor in one hand and Crazer in the other. Crazer's narrower body. Razor. I had both of those. <laughs> so the Razor's got the membrane keys. Not really amazing. Not great for tactile feel, but they do make a little click when you touch them. Not an amazing design, but it shows we've got a camera now. And that was a major problem in data centers. Who here remembers that? Having an IT job, you couldn't go into a pharmaceutical company like a, a large one here in Connecticut or uh, military contractor sites that need clearance. There's no way they let this pass the front security guard. You'd have to check your phone at the door. All the IBMers doing service would need to request these special made with no camera. So the early days of camera phones are really kind of a nightmare for the IT professional. Um, so there you go. And the LCD is starting to appear on the side, things like how many calls you missed and all that. I am forgetting what this phone, uh, I guess it probably is Razer, I guess. I think they were, yeah, just, I think they're just Razors, Motorola yep. Razor. And then the Crazer is if maybe a year or two later, a narrower body, also that same membrane design, also Motorola product. Motorola was doing well and it now had a color lcd with fancier stuff showing even when the phone was closed this is a flip phone i'm showing so now we must be getting to uh i guess where are we late eh, we're in early 2000s now somewhere in the 2000s mm -hmm. and a rubbery back all right um i do not have let's see what do i have uh, oh okay. The hybrid. This this is this is a really weird era when we think of two thousand four, five, and six. All kinds of uh, well, what do you got there? IBM equivalent of Palm. So it's called a WorkPad C three. I remember going to the Raleigh factory, RTP Research Triangle Park, IBM site, huge factory uh, and warehouse where the visitors, we were lucky enough to be handed uh, three of these, me and th two other guys from all over the world, hopping on a plane, they handed us a parting gift. Like, thank you for coming to Raleigh. Really appreciate your feedback on our products. And by the way, you go home with the WorkPad C3. Those were good times. What year is this? I don't know. Probably early 2000s or late 90s. I no, I would say 2003, 2002, okay. 2003. Well, I, got a, I went to a conference. I went to a tech conference, like maybe 2001. And I think I got a free... Palm Pilot, which is the same the same design there, same exact design. Those those Palm devices were, and IBM had their own branded version of it. Yep, and then a hard hard shell that kind of protected you from accidentally hitting buttons in your and, pocket. And that was the the IBM had that the where, and I think um, where Palm had one that kind of slid over the top. But I remember being on a plane, there and I wrote. Good. I was blogging at the time, and I could write on the Palm device with because it had that little fold out keyboard. Right, the the Palm ones had that little fold out keyboard that would, and I would sit on a plane and I would actually blog onto the Palm device, 
And then when I got home, I'd sync it and take that data and move it into the blog and then post it. And it was some of the early productivity. It was great to be able to do that. In those days, I would my parents lived in Kalispell, Montana. And so every Labor Day, I would go out there and spend time with them. And on you know, those plane trips, I'd get a ton of work done uh, off that little Palm Pilot. Palm 5, I think, is what I had, something like that. It's hilarious. IBM WorkPad C3 troubleshooting on iFixit.com, released 1999. So iFixit, those folks are amazing. They actually have an IBM WorkPad C3 troubleshooting guide. Amazing. 1999 yeah. technology. Ken said HP had them. Handspring, there was the Handspring visor, other gen oh. says. Remember? Yeah. Oh, I just uh, haven't heard that company Sony name. Sony had their years. own version of it. This was, yep. this was that weird transition period, like I said, between 99 and 2007 when we, you know, of course the iPhone came out in 2007, I think. Yeah. Stylus. So for those great, listening, we're talking about devices. stylus. Removable stylus was the day. Capacitive touch wasn't yet a thing. There was no iPhone. So you were not touching a screen, you needed a stylus. Or if you had any kind of touch screen, you had to ram your finger in it, uh, push really hard, which was ridiculous. All right, so that's late 90s. Some really good productivity in there, Paul. I, I, I got a lot done on those. I, I put my calendar on them, they were great. What do you got there? Sony Clear. Anyone out there? I'm sure oh, someone yeah, in the chat. Yeah. Here we go, now we have decent sound. They actually have a speaker on the back. This is a step up in price. You had a volume on the side, uh, a rocker. Uh, and let's see. Palm powered magic gate, Clea personal entertainment organizer. Interesting title for this thing. <laughs> this is a peg TG 50 slash U. I would have to look up the year. Um, so I'm going to probably get it. I'm opening it up for those looking at the YouTube. And there we have a full QWERTY keyboard. And does uh -huh. that not look like the, uh -oh, the Blackberry of a Blackberry? Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So there it is. Uh, what are we seeing on the screen? Some scratches from the st stylus, I guess, and chiclet keys that actually lit up. So this thing was a pretty darn good device. And if it had a battery that worked, it would probably fire right up. Could you plug so, it in and, and power it up on, what, even what kind of connector does it have? Proprietary long, yeah. kind of like a longer than a 30 pin yeah. Apple connector. And even kind of foreshadowing what we'd see in the iPhone. Exactly. And a lot of proprietary chargers back then. Um, I do not have a phone that was, let's see, 2006, early internet. Um, who made it? Anyhow, you could tether your phone and share its data in the late 2000s with the USB cable. Those phones would tend to heat up a trio. Uh, was it a trio? Maybe yeah, it was a trio. trio. Terrible, unreliable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but anyhow, the Clio was, Clio was a little before that. You were still syncing with your PC at that point, and that's year 2003. Okay, so I got the sequence. I looked it up. It's 2003, seen it, reviewed it. Um, so yeah, it's a tradition, transition, transition. You're still very reliant on synchronizing with a PC for your contacts and your address book and all that. You weren't quite doing it at yet. The trio is where we had another. Isn't that weird to think that we would yeah. sync to the PC and not sync to the internet yet? So you would, you'd have this relationship between your device and the PC, but CompuServe and AOL were just coming online in those days, and many people didn't have internet. So you would sync. PC sync to device, but no internet. It's just crazy to think. No, I agree. Um, you know what? I you got showed a my... BlackBerry there. Is that what you just showed? A uh, trio, actually, but it's got a. Uh... Okay, it's got my dad's stickers all over the back. Let me just take that off. Battery compartment, replaceable battery compartment, camera. We talked about that. Speaker. So that's a trend now. They're becoming entertainment devices and sound. A speaker phone was important, and there you go. Very BlackBerry like. Mm -hmm. This is the Verizon branded trio. Uh, again. Uh, keyboard, not um, not unlike a BlackBerry with a navigation up, down, left, right. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Really last uh, one before the smartphone. And a stylus holder. Uh, the stylus is long since lost, but again, you were tapping on a rather small screen. This is probably only inch and a half by inch and a half, something like that. So it's called the Trio. And I think that might have been one of the first phones you could tether for data with your PC, which is a big deal as a guy who was going around with Microsoft streets and trips with a GPS that was serial attached with the bright orange <laughs> yep, GPS, right? Yep, so I've been I one of those too. 20, 25 years of GPS in my car yeah, yeah. for all the family could, road trips. You could buy them separately. And uh, I remember I bought one um, and we used it, God, we used it early. And I, God, we thought we were so cool. I plugged it into a laptop and we had a laptop running in the van while we had this GPS going. It was so stupid, but we, <laughs> you know, we did it and we got it done. That kind of, that reminds me um, of the, I had a, 
Windows CE device that was that looked a lot like that. And I forget who maybe Motorola made those. Big screen, but it ran Windows CE. It was terrible. It never worked very well. It was just awful. And that okay, was the that, very first. That would have been 97, 97, 98. I did have one of those, and that was the one that was much less, much more flaky. The Palm Trio, I should not yeah. have bad-mouthed it. Palm OS was stable. Yeah, it was Windows C that was lousy. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I that looked this terrible. up. The Palm Trio 650 I'm holding is 2004. So, yeah, okay. we've been showing the tech pretty much sequentially here. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's the the forerunner. A lot of folks had those, and then they moved to BlackBerry, and then they moved to smartphones. That was kind of the that was kind of the jump. A lot a lot of the business guys did, and gals. Okay, here's another flip phone, not particularly noteworthy. Don't even know the model. Opening up the battery compartment, I see that beloved brand of Radio Shack. <laughs> when I, they were already becoming a cell phone company, right? They were starting yeah. to have less and less transistors and resistors sort when you went in. Yeah. Sort of. And yeah. this thing is dated September 07. So uninspired tech. Yeah, it's got a camera. It does not have a speaker. This is a low-end flip phone. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was probably uh, under $200 or something. Yeah, you would. that's what, you know, if you just wanted a phone, you yep. would just go in there. I remember going into a Radio Shack. Oh, this would have been 2004 four maybe something like that and i said this was before the smartphone and i was like what i really want is a phone that has data i could store things on i could keep things in it would take pictures it would have music it would have everything and the guy said to me that uh, nobody wants phones that have everything in them <laughs> that's what the guy at radio shack said to me no nah, nobody wants those and i was like okay <laughs> i think i'll go someplace else <laughs> yeah once you lose trust already, but yeah what else you got once you lose trust it's hard to get it back yeah. All right. So I think we're done with um, phone tech. Um, now we can move on to briefly, let's see, camera, audio. Let's do audio. Next. What's this? So anyone know the name of the company that would color your iPod? So we're looking at a hard drive iPod, 40 gig in size. Let me show that to the camera. Early, early iPod. Let's see if the Logitech. Uh, yeah, I saw it for just a focus. second. There you go. Yeah, we just saw it. it. There it is. Yeah, it's pretty scratched. Yep. And the front. We had one of those. Paint. So that company did a fantastic job making this thing look pretty cool. So these were white iPods, but you can make them black or other colors. And there it is, color wear. Tony Rayner wins the prize on that one. Nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're having fun in the chat. I got to keep remembering. I got to remember to look at it. Clear. Yep. People were naming what I was showing you. All right. Next. Uh, so that's audio. What came before a hard drive on the iPod? Rio Volt came before that. Who the heck oh, remembers yeah, Rio. this? Yeah, what's special about it? You see the logo there is MP3. So now you're looking at a CD player that's special. I could put 148 songs on a single CD and play some uh, silly tunes with the kids driving around. Play them in random order. 148 songs, I believe, is what you could put on a single CDR. You burn it, put it in your car. And then when you get tired of those songs, you'd make another CDR and stick the hunk of plastic in and make another it mix. Too. Yep. My daughter just pulled hers out. You know, I told you we she pulled out her box. We had one of those too. Uh, not same, exact. not the exact same color. Ours was red, but that was those came out. There was a generation of those for a couple of years, and they were kind of amped up CD players. And uh, and she listened to a ton of music on that thing. We were ripping CDs all the time. Uh, Ken always says SanDisk. That was another company that was making, I think, making those those kinds of players. But yeah, yep. there was that era, right? There was that CD era. Looks like Sonic Blue is who they got them from. I'm trying to find the Rio Volt year, and I'm struggling a little bit if which model I'm at. But uh, it looks like we're talking about maybe late, late 90s. Come on, Mark, give me a date. Mark Early. Robson, while you're looking that up, Mark Robson said, I think they offered an MP3 player too. Yeah, Rio was one of the first. I think even before the iPod came out, there were yep. Rio MP3 players and they were like 64 megs or something and uh, super small and you could get maybe an album on them. Um, exactly. So, so I'm painting a picture of how would you do a playlist in your car? That was a game changer. It was awkward looking. Mine has Velcro and actually... Um, had a van at the time and this thing was in the dashboard. I made my van have a fancy way to play 148 songs on demand, right? It's pretty cool. And you had an LCD display that actually showed you in a scrolling ahead. ticker and yep. skip ahead. Yep. Yeah. That's all game changers 99, that looks like. And then let's see, when did the 
iPod arrived, the one I showed you that had the hard drive, early 2000s. So yeah, we're just changing the from 99 yep. to 2000s with the late. The Other gyms that's creative had an MP3 player too. They did. Yep, there were a few in there. Digital River, I think, was another company that was that was doing MP3. That era went fast. I, I yeah. do remember it was like. 2000 i remember in 99 we were first starting to rip mp3s that was the early days of them and then by early 2000s they were getting pretty popular you could you could you know people were sharing them and stuff like that but still not a lot of great ways to do a mobile offside your computer and there was a whole bunch of things that came out like that and then the ipod came out and it was freaking over they were all just done they all just went out of, you know they all just stopped making them and everybody bought an ipad or an yeah, ipod we have Mark Robson pointing out MP3 stored in SD. Yeah, there was actually Compact Flash in my uh, the car. I still have a 2006 Honda Civic Hybrid with the nav where you push a button, it ejects, opens up where you can put in a CD or Compact Flash for MP3. So that held on for a little while. Cars are always behind, right? But all the way to 2006, you still had uh, companies holding on to putting a playlist in your car without you know Wi-Fi. So that was well, a, a cl those. clumsy solution, but yeah. We have those players in our car. It's their 06. You can put the CD in and it will not just yep. play the CD, but if it's, it, it'll go through the tree structure in there and you can, you can, you know, kind of go through it. I've never, Paul, I've never used that CD player in my car. You and I have the exact same car, same year, same color. Except for, right? except for the nav. Yeah. I have the nav where I could actually had an external CD changer that would be in the trunk, but I use that for iPod controls. So to this day, my iPhone 10 is on the dashboard in a one, one-handed uh, operation, Pro, Pro Clip USA makes these uh, pricey but very rugged plastic um, cradles that go in your dash, lightning cable um, to an interface where it pretends it's a CD player for my 11-year-old, a 12-year-old car now. Works great. I can hit next on the stereo on the steering wheel. Jim, you and I had this conversation in Fry's at one of Dave McKay's meetups. Mm -hmm. Remember, you were looking around for a, an Android uh, holder. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it I, it's nice to keep tech cranking along. Car works fine, steering wheel controls, 30 second back and forward uh, through your podcast without taking your hand off the wheel. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Uh, all through cars that thought they were changing CDs. It wasn't about iPod control back then. <laughs> no, I have an ox. I had, I don't have the nav, although I had a, I had to look for a nav device on like eBay and just put it in. Those are, it's pretty easy. Pull out and pop it in. But, um, but I, I don't, um, my ox cable. So I just have an ox in. So I run it through a Bluetooth, you know, device in. But it's starting to, the solder is starting to go. And so now it flips back to the radio and I've got to kind of rig it so that it, it's a, it's a 12 year old car. Right. And so I got to kind of yep. rig it to, to make it work. And I can think I don't want to take this thing apart and there's got to be a different ways to do this, but it's, uh, yeah, it's that, that, that car is 12 years old. It's still in great shape. 190. I have now, what do you, what do you think's on your, on your 100, 148,000, I believe. Okay. Yeah, and the battery um, died just before 100,000, so I was able to replace it. We both, that yeah, you, you alerted me to that, and then it went, and I got mine replaced under warranty, too. Nice. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> that could have been gone the other way. That's great. No, it was great. So you've made it all, almost to 200,000 now on that second battery. Yeah, and it will definitely go, above, you know, I think it's going to go beyond two, and then my daughter will get it. So. Nice. Hey, Jim, uh, should we go to auto pick whose face shows with voice? Yeah, or no? we, got a few, we got a few more minutes. Let's, let's okay. go through it. All right, so um, tech here, we covered audio. We'll go back to storage. Let me do a little satellite. Let me just throw this one off. So anyone remember CNET on Sirius? So there I am commuting 100 miles to my IBM job in Waltham, Mass. And I'm um, on the highway, um, hour and 40 minutes each way out of rush hour, being entertained with something like a podcast. It was a CNET channel on Sirius satellite radio. And this is the receiver that you see a trend here. Heavy duty industrial Velcro on the back, sticking that in the dashboard, making the trip a whole lot more entertaining. I wonder if someone on the chat actually subscribed to satellite radio for that reason, where you could drive 100 miles and keep one station. FM, you can't do that, right? Awesome. That really changed things, made those long drives way less boring with someone talking about tech. Not a great show. It was CNET, you'd listen to whatever the heck it was, antivirus or whatever they talk about. Boy, we come a long way listening to niche podcasts like we now listen to, right? We listen to exactly what you want to hear. Hey, um, Paul, Ken was asking, what was that device that you had, the CD adapter? Oh, in the car. Okay. Um, I've got that. Let's see. I'm going to go and search for ProClip USA, one word. 
on tinkertry.com and I should have my article, I think, lists out what the heck the name of that adapter is. Paul's whole life is written out on tinkertry.com. Everything is his whole life written out, tinkertry.com. I didn't mention that up front, but if you uh, if you're listening and this is the first time you've caught Paul Brennan on Home Gadget Geeks, by the way, he is a regular here. But uh, you want to head over to tinkertry.com where his site is. And it's way more helpful than the average guy.tv. So you want to spend a whole bunch of time out there. There's a lot of great a lot of great stuff he's documented. I appreciate that, Jim. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks that. like th this article probably has the adapter in there. It's kind of long, like my articles tend to be. Uh, but somewhere buried in there is probably, there it is, iCarKits.com. Let's see if that company's still there. So I threw it in the chat, um, and now we got an answer. Okay, cool. Let's move on. So, um, oh yeah, I'd actually Velcro these, an iPod stand to the same car, and now you could just one-handed put the iPod in <laughs> and play your music in the car. Um, <laughs> That's like meant for your desk, Paul. <laughs> I know. Calculators we talked about, fancy calculator. That's when you get into college, you got something fancy oh, yeah. sci science on there. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's talk about uh, that could be a whole early 90s. Itself. Working with students coming in. The college world was often kind of Mac-ish, but this is the 90s. Now PCs were up and coming. So college I was first working at would standardize on a particular modem. And this is the famous US Robotics 56K modem. Oh, yeah. This would be 1993 when I started my IT career at a help desk, reducing the backlog and helping people with their modem troubles. Mm. As they went from DOS to Windows and mm -hmm. SLIP and TCP IP became a thing. Show the back of that thing. The internet. What's on there the back go. there? What do you Ridiculous got? serial yeah. cable, right? Look at the size of that <laughs> thing to connect to a PC. 25 pins. Awesome. With dip switches. Dip switches. <laughs> so your phone calls and tech support were, yep, flip this, get a pen out and flip dip number two and three up and the other one's down and, and all. Because and so that's things. how you would control those things. There's the firmware was controlled by the dip switches, right? You had no access. You had no web access to the, to the, to the, you know, to the, um, Firmware yep. that's in there, the dip switches, you turn them on and do this dip, you know, the, they would do different things. You could clear it that way. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So 56,000. Hey, let's see. Right now we are transmitting 56K. Uh, five megabits per second up and 30 megabits down. I'm watching the live stream and talking to you. So we've come a long way. You and I even did a Google Hangout on a plane four years ago, Jim, right? <laughs> I know. That was awesome. Know. Early it days of great. planes. No one was using great. the Wi-Fi in the plane. No. <laughs> you and me doing a Google Hangout. It wasn't illegal or anything. There was no policy. It was awesome. It. it was like the month of, you know, one of the months ago. Well, cool. All right. Now one of the proud moments. moments. Uh, I'm going to do photography. Tier 2000, this changed our family. We went into digital photography. Or 2001, this first Kodak. Mm. This is actually quite affordable. Not amazing. It's probably one megapixel, I think. Looking back at the pictures, they're not great, but they're not horrible. And this is as the company Kodak, the beloved brand, was trying to hang on and move to digital not quite fast enough. Other companies like Canon uh, were wiping the floor with them and making oh, yeah. slicker bodies yeah. like that sucker. Yeah. And you can see a ton of those. LCD they must have sold screen. a million of those things. Yep. So I'm showing folks oh, Canon PC1037. What do you think yeah. the res is on that thing? Six, 640 by 320? I'm going to look it up. I want to find out the year. So Canon PC1037. Let's see if there's a wiki on it. Any guesses in the chat room while, we're, while Paul's looking it up? I'm, I'm going to say 640 by 320. It had a recall in 2006. Purple, okay. <laughs> um, I don't think you did firmware updates back then, but it no, uh, no. looks. And, uh, we, I don't we know. We went to Okinawa. Um, let's see. When, when did we go to Okinawa? It would have been 90. No, nah, maybe the res is better than that because we went to Okinawa in the late 90s and had that our phone had that. And just They took the crappiest pictures. August 2002, 3.2 megapixels. Yeah. Remember Sony Mavica uh, at IBM? I was commissioned to. Fire up, uh, let's get a digital camera. And back then it was a Sony Mavica saving your digital photography right on a floppy disk. I do not have one of those, but for those young enough to not remember, floppies became hard in 1987 with the PS2 that I showed earlier. That's IBM's, you know, 3.5 inch push introduced with a bold PS2, which introduced mm -hmm. PS slash two. It introduced the small form factor we showed in the keyboard interface. And it introduced 2.5 inch floppies, which were the first things that you would save on digital. They were great. We we got early. I, I had, we had gotten a whole eight, a group of 8088s from HP for our school. I was a senior, and we learned BASIC in the first ever computer course offered at the high school. And so we were the first class. Teacher didn't know. I mean, they were the teacher was learning along with us. So this would have been 85, 86, and those had just. I mean, they were just coming out those floppies. 
and uh, we use those to save save information. Great. So here's DLT tape, DLT4 format. How do you save all the stuff we've been talking about? Fuji DLT tape, and I've got a nice label on there. Apparently, March of 2001, I've got my ThinkPad T20 uh, backed up, and I've got some sort of index I printed out of the files that live on this tape. How do you read this tape? Well, if you got a SCSI adapter with SCSI terminators, who the heck remembers those? 50 pins <laughs> and a fan. Look at this drive. That's built monster. like a tank. It weighs about 20 pounds, I would say. Crazy, well built, over engineered stuff. Yeah. And the heyday of SCSI. That's how you interface with your server. And back up. If you're uh, if you're listening to the audio only, I know it's late. <laughs> it's a rough this. one. Yeah, I yeah. should have said you should have came over and just watched the YouTube video. But good chance to come by. Uh, Paul is showing us all this stuff. So. You're just watching the audio or just listening to the audio. You might want to come over and watch the video at some point. Uh, token Ring Networks, 2005, cloning PCs in a classroom was the first thing I was doing with Ghost. So people remember Ghost. Almost oh, any yeah. IT pro remembers Ghost in the oh, 90s. Great. We had a classroom full of 16 of these external SCSI drives. You'd image these drives, but you might need to prepare for a class you'd have to turn over in minutes. So you'd have 16 more drives ready with Linux or Windows NT or whatever the next, or OS2, whatever the next class was all through that same SCSI interface. So the PCs had external drives and enclosures like this. You'd clone them with Ghost, which is called multicasting. You'd send one server, one master machine you'd create with an instructor who would be flying in. You'd blast it out to the 15 other machines in the room, all with one multicast stream. And what do you know, all the hard drives are being imaged all at once. That was the magic glory days of Ghost in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a data transfer story there. Tape. Don, Don is asking in the chat room, got any zip disks? Did you? I was an IO, iOmega. I was an iOmega. I was a big iOmega guy. Love my zip disks. And I always yeah. wanted to back up to them. They just, they were the, this was a product I never could really get to work right. And I wanted it to work so bad. I went, those are iOmega devices. I just wanted them to work and they just never would work for me. They were awful. Click of death. Some of those other problems that they had. So, but you have zip? Uh, I only have jazz drives that I tweeted about and pictures out on them handy. So whoever asked in the chat, there's the link oh, in the chat. You're now yeah. rewarded with an iOmega jazz drive. These are hard disks kind of in a floppy enclosure. Um, so yeah, you can take a look at what a jazz drive was. Bernoulli drives were big then too. Do you remember those? It was a weird time for storage. Absolutely. It's just, I just remember it's just weird. We, you know, we just, Thanks. we were in between things and I don't think we were really saving that much to the web yet. Nope, nope. And so, and, and, but we needed more hard drives were expensive and we needed more space. So what do you got there? Show it again. Yep. Sony tapes. Uh, what are these called again? Um, DG 120M is a digital data storage DDS2 format of tape. And here's a reader for it. And on the back, I've got 50 pin SCSI again. So SCSI is the way wow. to SCSI. do archiving. So I could actually probably... Cool. I could probably get data off of all this stuff if I tried hard enough. How, how, how big, how much storage on that tape do you think? Yeah, I wish it told me the capacity. Let's see. This one says 120 megabytes. <laughs> 20 so megabytes. 100, 120 megs. But remember, this is only 1.44. I know. Right? So I know. 120 megs. Or 2.88 if you. Uh, have now we look at 120 gig hard drive and laugh. Although, even, yeah, even SSD, we kind of like, oh, come on. So 99 comes along and tape drives, still king and moving around in classes and setting up classrooms with my IBM job. But then we get to Plex Store, a big brand and CD writers. They were the ones that didn't crap out on you and create coasters. It tended to work a little better, cost a little more. Plex Store was king of the early days of CD burning, where it was more like an art than a science. You had to have the exact driver and all that. And uh, yep, this one looks like it's a IDE rather than SCSI. So now you're becoming a commodity thing mm -hmm. you can put in, in any computer. In IDE computer. days. Paul, I think we're going to wrap it with that. Uh, Ooh, well, we, anything else you want? We got some, we got some post show. So well, if you got one more thing that you want to show, bring, bring it out and we'll wrap it with that. Oh yeah, we got to show this one. We That's for sure. Will it run without the power? Well, I'll bring power in a second, but first okay. I want to show you what's All special. Right. This is a ThinkPad 70NC Butterfly. Watch this. Oh yeah. Do you see that keyboard? <laughs> Way before it's time. Look at that keyboard. That's that is something special right there. That was in our IBM museum in the lobby at IBM Waltham. Um, it'd be really cool if someone actually was there and saw a little museum I helped create in early days as a you know 20 something year old working with a bunch of IBMers who were used to you know green screen and all. I come in, they're like, hey Paul, can you get five of the latest laptops, lock them down and Kensington locks, put them in the lobby and make a little museum? I'm like, oh yeah, this job's great. And here's an artifact from those times. Um, that keyboard got constant attention. This is a, I think, early or probably mid 90s machine. I am sorry, we'd have to look it up 
uh, wiki article. But guess what? It still boots. So let's end the video with this thing booting. Yeah, let's end it. The poor audio listeners, you got to see this ThinkPad keyboard. Yeah, you got to come on the YouTube anime. video. Yep. The way, uh, the, it's, can't do it justice. It's well, I it. love the way as you're booting that up. I just, I love the mechanics of that keyboard, the way it kind of slides out and then snaps together. Yep, right. we got to hear that IDE hard drive spin up on camera. Let's get the camera microphone. Okay, the power switch is a little uh, rough. Sounds like it's spinning up. Do we have a memory check? A bias power on yeah. self test working? Yeah. We do. It's dim, not the brightest LCD for those <laughs> watching, but soon you will see an operating system boot. Um, now, an interface. Anyone remember PC MCA cards? PC oh, yeah. card interface. There you go. How did you get your Ethernet and your modem in there? You got a double height PC MCA card adapter, and it was Card Bus. It was the new, snazzier, fancier one. Okay, we have a bias oh. memory error. It's a little mad that its clock doesn't make any sense. So we can hit escape and continue starting the system. Oh, yeah. Let's turn off some lights in the room here. Look at that. Woohoo! Windows ME. Everyone's, <laughs> everyone's least favorite 90s vintage Windows. That's what's loaded. I laughed so um, hard when I fired this up. Not only did the hard drive. Here, listen to the hard drive. Come on, people, pick it up. Come on, microphone. You can hear that IDE hard drive spinning. You can see the glowy light flickering. The days where you actually had a drive indication because your drives were so slow, you need to know it was doing something. <laughs> um, and you could hear your hard drive. Oh, the fun memories. It's almost like hearing a screeching modem, right? It just brings back a crappy so, SSD's revolution. They've, uh, so many good memories. memories now today when I hear that ticking sound of the hard drive, you know, the yep. that it makes, I, I get frustrated. You know, it's like, oh, what is that sound? Even though I don't, you know, I know I'm not hearing a hard drive. And we got a card bus complaint. Card bus was finicky. IRQs and all that junk. Even a laptop to give you trouble. Oh, so I'm man, closing an IRQ problem with the Zircom card bus adapter. And now, hopefully, a Windows will auto log in with any luck, and we'll actually see the Windows desktop. That boot time was actually not that horrible for a hard drive that's mechanically spinning. But still, opening an app like Notepad or Winamp, I think, is on this thing. Oh my gosh, waiting 20 seconds for Winamp or something, right? How spoiled we are now with SSDs. It mm -hmm. was a total game changer. Laptops were absolutely crippled by their spinning hard drives. that? Like a decade. Beautiful. So that's really saying something about engineering that things still goes. Now, um, I'll wrap up. There was a 25th edition, so it was appropriate to show that, right? Uh, there was a recent set of articles about ThinkPads. Uh, given they had their 25th anniversary, people got a factory tour. I talked to a guy who was just in Lenovo factory in Japan, which was awesome, showing the, the abuse testing. No, uh, Shanghai, I'm not sure where he was, sorry. And then finally, Dell had a 20th anniversary, and here it is, their high-end premium Dell Precision 5520, which I'm blessed with, with my uh, job at VMware. It has a special color paint, kind of cool. So I get to play with, you know, both. I've had a whole lot of time with ThinkPads for 25 years, and I'm getting to play with some higher-end um, Dell products as well, and comparing and contrasting. So flash forwarded today, and we're now up to a terabyte of SSD goodness, right? So you have it, Jeff. Do, you think, do yeah. you think you could get that ME device connected to the internet? Yeah, if I could get past the card bus error, it's got yeah, a Zircon you in there. Card bus, right? Yep. Yeah. That doesn't work, and that means maybe finding a driver. Yeah. Or whatever what the version error. of IE would be on there? Do you think? Let's fire Is it up and find six, out. Six, maybe. IE six on there. I'm gonna say, uh, you know, we're, yeah, you won't get. You'll just get it. You know, when you when you fire it up, you'll just. We got our trackpad yeah. nubbin. Yeah, I can do help about. Hopefully, I still have the hourglass for those listening. The machine <laughs> is still booting. It's got something <laughs> called DU meter. It shows you how what your bandwidth is doing up and download. That's a, a company I think that's still out there. The dial-up networking dialog is showing up here. I don't really want to see that. I think the hard drive is actually settling down, and I'm going to launch Internet Explorer. Oh, the Internet Browser Wars. How do you remember Mosaic Web Browser? I remember when I first saw that. Uh, it was an awesome, awesome time. I first uh, saw it in a Sam's Club. I was, oh. they, I was in the software section, and they had they had uh, the, them side by side. And you bought you bought them in those days. If anyone remembers CUC Me, I was doing OS two beta testing of CUC Me, the the Windows NT version. The developer of that was sitting next to me. So if anyone's heard of that, it's like Brady Bunch. Nine people in a black and white video, uh, nine faces talking to each other all over the world in the early 90s. It was awesome, over a modem. It was incredible what you could do. Yeah, it, it was, was black great. and white, but you know. I remember those early days of, of uh, ICQ and such and talking to people around the world and how awesome that was. 
you know, today we take it for granted. We're here. Here we're doing video. All right, here we're going to show it there. What do we got? Oh, it doesn't. The auto exposure is working. There we go. It is. Right, there inter- we go. In Internet Explorer five point five. It's just with that point version it, off. That encryption that you could not export to other places with a 120 bit encryption. So it was this country alone. Remember that? And it says based on NCSA mosaic. Let's see if I can end with a shot that you can actually see. We got to get the exposure right. Come on, Logitech camera. Hopefully folks looking at the YouTube can actually read that. So yeah, it's just fun. Um, I do stuff with VMs, by the way. So OS2 still runs as a VM under VMware. And it's kind of like a living virtual museum where you don't need the hardware and you can just run a VM and get yourself uh, a look at old things like Windows 95 or OS2 running as a VM. Works on VMware Workstation, works on you know Hyper-V, works on VMware Player. Uh, it's fun to have like a living museum of old OSs yeah. uh, of your yeah. youth. Paul, thanks for taking the time tonight to pull all that stuff out. When we first started thinking about this vintage tech series, it actually was birthed in a, in a uh, the idea was birthed in a, a bus that... I was in in um, uh, I was with Dave McKay, but we were at MVP Summit. He goes, we ought to do a podcast where we just go all over old tech. I think people would really like that. And we, he and I, never got that put together. But uh, a little bit later, someone said to me, reminded me of that, and I thought, you know, we had to try it. We'll give that a try. I mentioned on a podcast. Of course, Eric uh, was on. I don't know, four weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Paul uh, does series two. If you're thinking, if you'd like to sit down, it doesn't need to be as extensive as what Paul just did. If you've got some old tech that you want to show, we'd love to have you on. Contact me, Jim, at theaverageguy.tv. We could set this up. It can be as complicated or as uncomplicated as you want, as ready or as unready. Yeah, you'll have to have a few things ready. It's helpful if you got some gear so your sound is good and some of those kinds of things. But uh, Paul, I appreciate you coming on and uh, and doing this. We'll do. We'll have some time in the post show too as well. So thanks for doing that. Anything else? You got one thing in your hand. You want to show one more thing before we go? <laughs> All right. Shout out to other Jim who in the chat says, Paul, you know, here it is. Plug in the U.S. Robotics Sportster. <laughs> oh, this is my go. answer for getting online with the, you know, the, the uh, butterfly. Thank you, other yes. Jim. That makes a whole lot of sense. I just need to find yes. a 25-pin serial cable. I know. And I know. I have, that's hilarious. And the adapter. Would it work? Because there's yeah. an adapter needed, and I still have that in the box. So the butterfly has no interfaces. You have to have an adapter like a dock. Could to you get the connect dock. Would you have the but right yeah. cables? Yeah, no, I, I don't think I recycled all of them. When I recycle junk out of my basement to the electronics bin, I try to keep like at least two of each kind of cable. Right, right. But there would be no service anymore, right? You could. Yeah, that's another thing. Online anywhere. I went and Googled dial up and I found some number that answered. It's like, okay, I, I might still have an account. I went through into my last pass and dug through ancient Earthlink stuff. I'm like, you know what? A modem still answers. So who knows? That would be fun. That's crazy. Uh, that would be kind of fun to old school connect. If you can do that, maybe we can get it recorded and uh, be fun to have it on here. See how quickly it gets hacked, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Maybe it's hack proof. I don't know. We didn't have many hack problems in those days. We had Wozniak hacking PBX boxes, but uh, it didn't seem like hacking was as big of a deal as it is today. So, 98 Millennium Edition, you're right. It's probably not a major target. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. We'll remind everyone if you want to financially support the show, we got a Patreon link. I mentioned that earlier. If you haven't uh, subscribed yet, we did from last week's show. There's actually a free video of Nathaniel Lindley and I talking about cryptocurrency and some average guy stuff. So, if you head out to the Patreon link, go to uh, patreon.com slash the average guy. All one word. That'll get you out there as well. If you want to support us while we're at it, one and five dollar plans. If you want to support Paul while you're at it, he's got a Patreon account as well. He's actually super worthy of being supported because his site has great content on it. So tickerdry.com. If you want to head out there, we'll have that all listed in the show notes and all the uh, articles that he referenced. Paul always does a nice job of going back into the show notes and making sure I have all the right links that I need. Uh, so we'll put those in the show notes um, as well. But if you want to get those videos, they're out there on the Patreon page right now. You can contact me again. Send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv. If you want to join us for a vintage tech episode, that's the way, that's the right way to do it. We'll get you in there. Uh, you can ping me on Twitter if that's easier, uh, just at Jay Collison. Don't forget the theaverageguy.tv platform, both web and media hosting, powered by Maple Grove Partners. Of course, Christian gives us secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people you know and you trust. And man, Maple Grove just keeps getting better. Those guys just are crushing it in the data center. For Maple Grove's plans start as little as $10 a month. If you got a podcast or you got a blog uh, and you, or you need some hosting, Christian would be the guy to do it. He only really likes to do it for Home Gadget Geek listeners. So head over there, maplegrovepartners.com. There was a special going on. I think Jingle gets you 10% off. We were doing that during the holiday season. I think it goes till the 15th. So you got 10 more days, 11 more days. If you want to get that done, Maple Grove Partners, all one word, 
Com. Don't forget, you can listen to Home Gadget Geeks. Both the Android and iPhone apps are available. All the recorded versions, everything live on our app. Go to HomeGadgetGeeks.com. The buttons are just right there. You can download it. It's a free app. Just have it. Have it on your phone. You never know when you're going to need to listen to us live. I get a 10 of you that do it every single week. At some point, you're listening to it. I get those stats when we're done here. It's crazy how many of you listen to it on the on the mobile app. But you can download it. It's free. We thank LastPass for their sponsorship. Paul, lately... I've been using LastPass to keep all my two-factor authentication uh, numbers. So, you know, when you set up two-factor and you put your phone up there and it sets it up in the Google Authenticator app and they say, okay, here's the number that you need in case you lose your device. For the longest time, I never did anything with those numbers. And that's a huge mistake. Yeah, yeah. if your phone dies, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you need to copy and paste them and put them somewhere. And so I created a special folder on LastPass just for all my 2FA um, or MFA, however you want to say it, um, just for those keys. And LastPass is a great way to do that. And you can do it in the file sections. And it's secure and all that other great stuff. I can get to it from any device. So we thank LastPass for their sponsorship uh, as well. And of course, that's built on top of Spreaker service. And so we thank them for their sponsorship. Don't forget t-shirts like Paul has right now. They're all, I'll show you one last, you get one last shot. We're going to make them available for another week. Head out to theaverageguy.tv slash shirt and you can get those at least here in the United States. And we appreciate you guys supporting the show that way. Uh, Mark Robson reminded me, uh, I was, he, he sent me a note. He said, who's on, who's on tonight? And I said, well, Paul Brown. I said, did I forget to tweet it? And he's like, no, no, no. I never look at Twitter. I always waited for the email. Well, okay. I'm going to really work hard. I say this every week, getting that email with who's coming up. If you want to sign up for it, go to the average guy.tv slash newsletter. And, uh, and I'll try to be better about that. I'm not promising anything. Cause I kind of suck. At that, we are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. Paul, stay around for a little post-show chat. Remember, you don't get the post-show unless you subscribe to us on Patreon. Love to have you do that for just a buck, buck a month. Easiest way to get in, you get audio and video is available for you as well. Paul, thanks for coming out. With that, we'll say goodnight, everybody. Good night. Great job, Paul. Man, you were loaded. <laughs> that was uh, awesome. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah, that was the most fun all day. It it was a long day. I was up uh plowing the plowing the driveway, getting my you know wife to work as a as a nurse, kind of important. And uh, I've been used to doing that for like twenty four years. No matter what the weather, got to get in and out of the driveway safely. So this is just such a fun way to end a long day, and uh, <laughs> getting the snow blowing done just in time. It all worked out. Phew. A little bit of a uh, family assistance with the museum. So yeah, no, it's and, it's uh, it was pretty. I, I'm impressed. I mean, you definitely rose the bar, raised the bar for uh for for having all that gear i i don't uh it's so i I'm, i threw a lot of that stuff away i wish i would have kept it you know just it's just broken stuff and you're like uh, i'm gonna throw it away well hopefully it gets you some subscribers to youtube channel hope, and hope maybe that video will be fun for a certain audience right oh, i think frankly yeah. i think a lot of people love it this this is a real popular topic cool all right i'm so glad to do it and boy uh people are still in the chat man your shirt's only 17.99 comfortable in all different colors so yeah yeah, um, yeah it's an cool. easy way to easy way to get uh to get it and i think we may have sold 40 of those 30 40 something like that it's a good good number addy you know i don't really uh addy set up the store for me and then um she uh, just makes sure they get sold and then um, i let her for for setting up the store and all the work she gets to take the profit on it and it's just a great deal i just don't want to mess with it and um she's doing such great work that uh, I wanted to support her in some way. So that works out real well. Tony's asking if the shirts run small. Um, mine's extra large. It's it's 58% cotton. So it has been washed numerous times. It hasn't shrunk significantly. So I'd say it's actually an accurate XL. It's not hanging crazy big on me. Sometimes XL uh, might shrink. I would say uh, it has a good length. It's not like, you know, short on your uh, belly. Yeah, they're really comfortable. Annoying. I like mine. I got an XL. Yep. I should have so, worn, uh, worn every night. I always forget. I, I, pimp gallop instead of the average guy on tv so yeah no you're not uh clearly not using it as a you know big money raiser just a, a very modest yeah. price so i'm impressed I, I had a lot of people who wanted to um who wanted shirts and i just was like I, I just didn't have the mechanism i just didn't want to do the work to put up a store and those things you have to do on amazon to get that done and amazon's really kind of revolutionized this because those t-shirts are custom made when you order it so you order it, they make it, boom, it gets shipped off. There's no inventory. So it it that that helps. 
Um, Tony says they're listed as slim fit. They might be. Um, I don't know. I'm not very slim and it fit me. Okay. I, it is, um, it's definitely a, it's definitely snug and it's that soft cotton material. So it's not, it won't lay over you loosely. So if you want kind of a loose hanging t-shirt, you should probably go a size up, but, um, and then if you don't, if it doesn't fit right, just return it. I think you can do that as well. Um, but we appreciate uh, we appreciate you guys doing that. I'm kind of excited. I'm I'm starting to think, Paul, about like what we do with the next version of it. Because uh, I want to do, a, I think, twice a year. I want to do one for the spring, and then I want to have a special meetup edition that you only get if you come to the meetup. Uh. And uh, so I am um, starting to think about how do I how do I want to do the designs on those. This was just the standard OG logo. What month might your meetup be? September. It's going to be mid-September. Nice. All right. Uh, cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. Right now, I think I'm shooting for, I can kind of tell you a date. I haven't said this to anybody. So if you're listening right now, this, you'll, you'll hear it here first. I'm shooting for September 15th right now. So the people listening uh, you know, to this extended video might still be watching or no? You still have video rolling, right? Oh, okay. everything's rolling. We're still live. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Everything. So um, I'm going to make a shout out to Chris Compton, who was talking about printers and he's a guy who mails out stickers like you do right the, the nice personal touch what a nice guy so if, if yeah. someone's listening to this or on playback and youtube or whatever and you've thought about meetups like what dave mccabe did and now jim collison sounds like he's planning yeah there's nothing like meeting the people i'm chatting with right tony rayner know him saw him three different times it's awesome right that community and meeting these people and then he was reaching out and talking about printers so i'll give you guys a little sneak peek um so to print out labels that go in the back of servers, here's a machine that cuts them with an X-Acto blade, basically. So it's like a plotter. You know, it's doing a fancy X-Acto blade cuts precision on the sticky paper. Over here on the left is a higher end, you know, Epson printer printing out quality you labels. You show that so, on the screen? Yeah. Uh, yep. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I saw you looking at it, and I'm like, uh, we're not. Finally, the lack of sleep really surfaced just uh, then. <laughs> All right. Let me. Uh, Focus is on you. Okay, screen sharing now happening and just a little preview. So we got a big Epson printer that prints high quality images that don't smear. And then you've got a cutter where you can make things like labels for the back of a server. So I'm having fun with that and uh, my older son. And um, yeah. Um, That's at home? You have that at home? I do. This is a room we're actually kind of just setting up as a little bit of a print shop. So yeah, it, it's... It's awesome to have, you know, some advertisers, some sorts of in revenue from a hobby that I've been doing for six and a half years, right? 900 blog posts. So well, um, I got your stickers. It, it makes stuff like this possible and, uh, and more to, more ideas to come. If you look at the, if you look at the, hold on, let me, let me flip this over here. If you look at, I think I still, yeah, you're right. You're right here on my, the back of my surface, Paul. So if you, if you look, uh, we got, I got your stickers two, two um, times ago. And of course, you so you've made the bottom of the surface. It's a little warm. I must have been running some stuff on here. It's it's feeling a little warm. Here's the there's the front, but right there, boom, right underneath Run Jovi. These oh, guys that's are nice running, running. Thank couple, you so much. Couple. I'm looking at the live stream, which is I think 12 seconds late. It's not so bad. It's not 30 seconds, and I'm looking at your machine. Thank you, Jim. That's very kind of you. Good little sticker, sticker back to the surface. I'm not necessarily a big sticker guy, but uh, nope. I thought, oh, the surface, I got all the space. I might as well put some stickers on it. So. Well, sticker the, mule is not cheap, so being able to make it at home could be pretty appealing. And um, yeah, it with so yeah, just the server labels for the back is something. Uh, bare bones systems don't tend to have any labels for what goes into where, so it's a nice little value add at fairly low cost that I can add to these uh, super servers. So yeah, just a shout out to Chris Compton who reached out to me about that very topic. He's recently. such a good guy. I need to get him. I, so nice. I, write that name. I need to get that name. I need to write. Oh, he, he'd we'll be great. Him know. The home automation stuff and what he's doing and such yeah. a cheer, cheerful demeanor. And it's been a while. Podcast. I it's think great. it's been a year or two since I've had him on. Oh. He'd be a good guy to have back on to kind of catch up with. How's my bandwidth? Do I look okay to you? Yeah, only the first five seconds when we first started the YouTube Hangout, and it stayed solid since. Um, Hopefully the YouTube looks it's good a for people. Fuzzy on my end. Let me. I, I may have run out of priority. Let me. I haven't looked lately. These YouTube live ones. Do they give full 1920, 1080, or is it like 720 and kind of blurry? Like, how's it's it going to look? And, and I think it just just, just kind of depends on your own. Yeah. Game. But I think I ran out of priority. So let's get that reset. So, I had the so offended... hopefully the times. Hopefully the times I showed things close show halfway decent for the YouTube. Yeah, video. look good on my end. Okay. 
It looked really good on my end. I just, I should only have during a hangout, I should only have two boxes in the house that are even up, you know, pushing up the broadcast server and my box. And um, I do, I give my box, I have a I have Google Wi Fi, so I give my box the priority. So it usually works out that my audio or my audio and video are the best, but yeah, it just went HD. So I, I had run out of priority. Another thing, something else was stomping over the top of it. So it had gotten bad. But back to HD now. I see the live stream's been going an hour and 36 minutes. Oh, no, an hour and 30. Yeah, wow. Time always flies with you. Thank you for, for the way that ended and showing the butterfly that, that worked out pretty well. So yeah, I'd, you know, I'd forgotten. I am glad that you pulled it out because it, it, I'd forgotten you had that. And so other Jim says it looks good. What's um, so when you think Paul, when you think about 2018 and your, your job, anything exciting on the horizon for you as uh, with VMware that, that um, you're excited about? Well, as we've talked about, my kids, you know, graduating from college at that age, I'm you know, more free to travel, right? So going to a hotel for 50, 50 something days a year, no big deal. It's small travel compared to what I used to do for IBM. So it's fun to be in front of customers. They tend to want me to stick around longer and want the meeting to go longer rather than, you know, looking at their watch, can't wait for you to stop talking. And that's a fun feeling to yeah. be talking to fellow IT nerds that are trying to save big bucks at work. They're tired of building like half million dollar storage arrays. They want yeah. something more sensible. And that's where vSAN fits in. So it's fun. Um, it's a, you know, you don't know if the customer is going to do something for two days, two weeks, two months, when them, or two years, but either way, they tend to value your time and you're showing them a different way of doing things that they might consider in the future. So, uh, I'm quite digging the job. When, when very, is the very, big conference? So VMworld is at the end of August, right? When the kids go off to uh, school or college generally, that's the big conference a whole week. And that's right after open world, right? Uh, Oracle's yeah. Open world? uh, maybe it's in Vegas. Okay. I don't know. Oh, it's, it's in Vegas. Okay. Yep. Sometimes it's been in Moscone. Close. San I Francisco. think they're pretty close. Or Oracle always does theirs at Moscone. Oh, what a fun uh, event seeing people there and 20,000 people. And you got Intel with their Optane. And, and now I know some people there and Supermicro with their servers walk over to their booth with a camera and record 4K video with a microphone. Just a blast. It's kind of like, you know, CES for IT nerds. For me, it's just a hoot to be there. And they treat bloggers really well at VMware. It's just very smart. They give bloggers all sorts of attention, including free passes to the conference. That's how I got there. Uh, it wasn't on IBM's dime. It was on me as a blogger that I'd get there. I'd pay for the flight and the hotel, and that's just an awesome deal. Very smart to treat people that volunteer hundreds of hours of their personal life to write stuff, right? <laughs> it's just a good move. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's going well, and uh, I quite enjoy it. And, of course, finding bugs has been part of my IT career for probably 25 years. I tend to be the guy that finds bugs and actually reports them because I hate to see them make it to a, a GA level product. Well, not only do you report them, but you stay on top of them. I mean, your attention to detail and your ability to organize and keep the thought and the, the process going is just amazing. And you just don't give up. I mean, I, I was thinking about your, you know, we had uh, Jamie from Ring on and then there was oh, some follow up with that and yeah. you just stayed on top of it. And you were very, very kind about it. It was, there was never, it was, Today's, uh, it really bothers me. There's, I, I just don't like where tech support has gone from a customer standpoint. I think customers feel like they got to be rude out the gate and I, it's just not necessary. You know, you're, I had, I had a situation tonight with one of, one of my customers and, you know, they get really kind of snippy with you and I'm like, look, Hey, I'm, I'm actually here to help you. Just, you don't, you don't need to insult me or insult the company. We're trying to do everything we can. And, and it, it's immediately, it just seems like tech support boils down to immediate, you know, they, they, it's, and it's either overt or covert. And I think I dislike covert. I mean, if you don't like something, just tell me, I hate it when it's disguised as jest or just kidding or smiley faces. You know, if it's, if you don't like it, just say you don't like it. Like, I'm okay with that. I could deal with that. But this, this backhanded passive aggressiveness just drives me nuts. And, yeah. Just, um, you know, disclosure. Anyways, you're really good. You're really good at it. I really appreciate that, Jim. Uh, disclosure is a problem in the industry. You know, not every company is as transparent as, say, IBM and HP. Uh, let, smaller shops don't tend to have release notes, and Apple got caught up in that, right? They should have told the world what they're doing with batteries, and they didn't, and they're paying the price yeah. by, by sounding sneaky, um, when actually what they were doing is quite logical by underclocking so the thing wouldn't abruptly turn off. But that's not right. the message that people yeah. hear. Uh, the ring well, video. They wanted to believe that, Paul. The Correct. community wanted that to be so true. They just confirmed it. This was a rumor for a long time. And, and so they link made it and they used it as, yeah. oh, they were trying to get you to upgrade your phone. Yeah. Yep. Um, hey, Ring Video Doorbell. I'm looking at that article that you talked about yeah. with Jamie. It's 
ridiculously long. It's like it's like a blog. Of, it's the whole story of owning it, returning the first one, getting the pro, regretting, and then happy with the pro ultimately after yeah. you know a few months of struggle. Jamie was awesome. He actually responded, right? The CEO and and um, two hundred and seventy two comments. That's probably my most commented article ever. It's risky to write about something so popular because, well, for one, if people think you're making thousands of commissions on Amazon or something, no, you might be lucky if you make a hundred, even if you know, 50,000 people read it after two years. So you're not getting reimbursed for free tech support that people kind of assume when you write something like that is risky. So that's kind of why I try to write thorough. Like I can only answer your question if you're asking me about something above, here's my experience. And then the comments tend to be a little more on point. Like, you know, oh, I bought the same transformer as you and you know, whatever. 272 comments, huge. Yeah. Most of my articles have, lucky if they have five comments, frankly. Do so, you, um, do you, automation, do you, wow. Um, do you curate your comments? In other words, do you, if it's not appropriate, do you not let it through? In six and a half years, I've had discussed since day one. I've only had to delete like four comments. I've really played people. That's good. Um, That's good. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of spam gets through. The swear words are filtered and they just won't post those. And anything with a link, I have to review before it right. gets approved. Yeah. So I can check out is the link something I want showing on my site. But even people don't abuse that that much. For the most part, so far, I don't seem to have, you know, a lot of trolls and nastiness. Thank goodness. Uh, that's you, good. That's YouTube good. is much worse, but, you know, that's YouTube. Yeah. I don't, I, I review every single comment on YouTube. And yeah. I, I, I get, I rarely get a troll every once in a while, but I don't, Gallup's different, but um, I just went through Gallup's today and was, there was a few in there was, you know, a little link bait and stuff. But yeah, you know, um, in the heyday for me with Amazon and the heyday was maybe 200 bucks, you know, to 250 uh, what's interesting, you know, they banned me twice in the United States, but my UK link still works. So every, every month I have a few folks in the UK that are still using the link, even though I never talk about it. And, uh, I make, you know, 15 to 20 bucks, uh, you know, in a gift card, which is very, really, really helpful. I've turned, uh, I turned this month's into one of those, uh, media Sonic four bay. Um, Oh, I have uh, one of those. Yes. Yeah. Do you, you got one? About the same thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's no, that's awesome to hear. Um, I got kicked out uh, twice as well <laughs> back in. Um, what a mess. I know. Um, I'll just leave it at that. But I, I recently signed up for UK, so I have no idea if it's really working yet. I only got that going maybe uh, 60 days ago, and I don't think I've seen my, anything yet. Um, so the Ring article, it was like 50,000 people you know, read it, which is awesome, I mean, it's awesome right? And, yeah. and it looks like it's still popular. People just, they want to know a transformer or a house wiring. It goes way beyond the FAQ on Ring. So enjoyable but also messy it's nothing like an engadget or other review of the week it comes out right it's well, more it like, maybe better i think it may be better well it's different it's not for everyone some people just want bottom line should i buy it or not right. well, that's, i'm not for them <laughs> so they're, they're not no. going to do well then that's not why yeah. Yeah, yeah kyle just got a pro for christmas and was struggling with it mark he jumped in our chat uh in the the average guy tv um facebook group and had posted it and mark helped him mark robson helped him troubleshoot the wiring and make sure the voltage was proper and i'd forgotten i should have i should have mentioned that article in there that you had written there's probably a lot of good info in there well when it comes to voltage and health safety i really refer people to call support for sure and talk to ring They're, they've been great to me on the phone um i will say someone left a comment recently that had me a little sad it's about a month ago saying yeah ring ring video trouble with wi-fi nothing but problems and he talks about one router he never tried any other wi-fi device he never tried i'm like well maybe let's connect temporarily connect tether via wi-fi to your phone with strong signal outdoors see if all of a sudden your problems vanish just temporarily because you don't own another router in your house he's like yeah because you know i'm kind of at the end of my rope here and ring even sent him a repeater a wi-fi repeater they basically sent him free parts to troubleshoot and get his wi-fi more resilient at the front yeah. of his house that's amazing customer service and he's still leaving a comment like disappointed and sad and it's like wow that's tough business to be in, in the wife, if any kind of device that is Wi-Fi and it's outside of your house. So it's going to be marginal for a lot of homes. I, that is I tough. think a lot of customers are unreasonable, Paul. Yeah, just, exactly. Nice. How can you make a profit with five yeah. hours of tech support and mailing someone a free, you know, $80 repeater device to, in hopes of keeping them from getting unhinged and they're still not happy. That is a tough business. No wonder that it's really tough to enter that market. <laughs> and, and people just feel entitled. And I sometimes right. I say that and I just take a shelling for it. Like, no, you need to beat on them and be unreasonable. And, you know, you're like, well, okay. I, there Obviously, there's a time for that. And there's times when they're given bad service and some of those. But I think we default to that too quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just like, no, I just, you know, I... I um 
uh, had an experience with Amazon. So the med, so the the Mediasonic four bay, you know, it's the it's got the four docking bays. I'm building a burst, and I'd bought in a Drobo from. So talk about great community. So I put a note out in the Facebook group. Hey, I'm <clears throat> looking for a Drobo. Anybody got a four bay they're not using that they would just be willing to ship to me? And so Nathaniel said, Yeah, I got one. I'll just ship it to you. <laughs> hey, I said I'll just reimburse you for the shipping. Ah, oh, great. So I gave him a little extra on top of it, but and I paid him in Litecoin, which is pretty cool. But so the Drobo came. It didn't really work the way I wanted it to. So I bought that that five bay. Well, I had bought before the Drobo. I had bought in the four bay Mediasonic, um, not the full case, but this is just the one where you put the the drives in a toaster, right? You put the drives in the slot. Yeah, I threw and, the link in the chat. I think we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, it came broken. Lectures. The first one I the oh, first no. one I had came broken. It just didn't. It wouldn't. I plugged it in and wouldn't turn on. So I no, the one I'm talking about, Paul. This is the full bay one. I'm talking about um, okay. Uh, a, the drive, you know, where it's it, just a flat box, and you put the, you insert the drives in on the top. You know what I'm talking about? What do we call those things? Why am I still struggling? This is actually more like a Drobo. This one is more like a drive dock. That's really just all it is. Anyways, came broken. So I, I pinged Mediasonic support. It was the day before Christmas. So nobody got back to me. But I went on Amazon and I went to their chat room and said, hey, what do I need to do? The guy in their chat room processed everything via chat and just said, okay, um, this is obviously not working. I'm going to go ahead and process a return. Here's your shipping label. Boom, popped up. I could print it right there. And he's like, send it in. We'll take care of it. As soon as we see the shipping label, used, we'll refund your money. Next day, day after Christmas, I went down to the UPS store, dropped it off. Within 10 minutes, I had a verification that my credit card had been had been um, with the money back. And two days later, I got this, the note from Med, uh, Mediasonic support. And they're like, you bought it at Amazon, you return it to Amazon. It's like, well, okay. That wasn't, I was hoping for a little bit more support than that. But Amazon was amazing. The, the interesting thing, you know, I just started really nice with the guy. I'm like, hey, I just bought this thing. I can't get it to work. Can you help me? You know, um, I, yeah. I just know so many people that would have started uh, with the jerk. Like, I can't believe you guys are selling crap like this. You yeah. know, I want my money back. You're going to give me a, you're going to ship me a new one overnight. <laughs> and it's a $50 part. Like uh, it was a refurb. Come you're on. bringing back memories. Like I'm sitting there at IBM. I'm with some customer. It's like 2 a.m. And a uh, $500,000 license of software. This crap software wasn't working right. It was load testing for hundreds of thousands of machines simulated. This is like late 90s, early 2000s. You can be believe that when I'm on the phone with tech support, on behalf of the customers sitting there with me, I'm going to be the most polite human in the world, letting this person know I'm sitting here at 2 a.m. with a customer. We had a rough day. <laughs> and we're hoping if you can help us shed some light in this bug that we just cannot find anywhere in your self-help forums or anywhere else. You start a phone call like that, by the end, you're like buddies. You know each other and whatever, because you're on the phone probably for an hour or two. You might as well be nice to other humans, right? Yeah, it tends to work out. It's just not worth it. Yeah. Oh, it's just, and I've had, I've yep. been on the other end. I've had my kids, my some of my kids have been tech support. And I just, God, it's just not worth it. And I just, it, it drives me nuts when people, you know, granted, you've had those experiences, bad product, bad customer service. Folks have called in. It's been bad. I get that. But it just, it drives me nuts when we go, we immediately go negative, you know, from the, from the get-go. So. so, so Jim, my last seven years at IBM there were basically support uh, enterprise storage. If something went down, we were now on the phone for 20 or 30 hours straight. Yeah. <laughs> and I was the guy leading those phone calls, the voice of IBM getting maybe yelled at, where actually it was almost always 95% of the time something else broken. So by the end, they'd be apologetic, realizing IBM offered outstanding support, it's taken with them 20 hours, where it had nothing to do with our product in the end, over and over that theme. So you feel proud by the time you got through, but it was also grueling, right? D being basically on pager duty. Uh, glorified, you know, enterprise, a lot of the stakes are high. They're losing millions every minute. They're down, all that stuff. But still, <laughs> IT careers are not easy. <laughs> you hear no, this all around. No. And there's Drashen in the chat saying, yeah. Tell yeah, I'm sure, he, <laughs> I'm sure he takes his his brunt of the customers with, with, um, with the product that he supports. Which is great, by the way. I've got two, I think I have two licenses of um stable bit drive pool that oh, cool one of my home server and then i've got one what am i doing the other one oh uh one on the plex box that that uh, puts all the drives together into one i think it has three drives that i, I put them together into one just a great little product it's perfect for that stuff yep so you think wi-fi is bad how about data that's irreplaceable and trying to help customers talk them off a left cliff what could be tart right that's the job yeah, <laughs> no yeah no, i know and they're just so mad 
And, you know, that's even worse. I mean, in the enterprise, it's even worse because I think there's some expectation that when you call tech support, you're going to light them up first thing to let them know who's boss. You know, and I just, uh, I'm not, I've, I've been in some situations like that where I've been the one calling and I've had managers, not recent ones, but I've had managers in the past who've said, you need to be a, you know, you need to be a bigger fill in the blank. You know, yep. you're, you're not hard enough on them. And it's like, well, no, I'm not going to be. Other Jim makes a good point that by the time people get past level one True. support, they're often pretty darn aggravated or long hold times or robo menus, right? And that's our world. They're used to terrible support. So sometimes they're just yeah. taking it out on you. Most people are very nice. In my whole IT career, I'm quite blessed with 25 some odd, pretty awesome years, most of it. It's so true. People well, are good. It's super true. It, it, is, uh, it is hard. And, you know, especially with some of those organizations have put that support stuff in place. Because they get so overwhelmed, they're damned if they do, if they damned if they don't. They, they, they have no way. I mean, they, I guess in the end, they should just hire more people. But they get so many support calls that could be handled with automated support. I called Cox the other day. I just lost internet, so I called them on my cell phone, and they were the robo was able to identify my, which is what the phone number, identify my router. It re all automatically. It rebooted it. It did some speed tests and the whole time it was walking me through, wait just a second, I'm going to send, and it was telling me exactly what it's doing. Wait just a minute, I'm going to send some information to your router and let me see what I get back. Wow. All robo, right? And so it did that first level of tests before I even talked to a human. And I bet they found in their numbers, 70% or whatever of the time, 50% of the time, they can, they can fix those calls with just these robo um, these robo instructions. And, uh, and so you can't blame them. It brings the support costs way down. Um, so I don't know. So we got Drashna saying Comcast is a bit of a different story compared to your Cox story. Um, <laughs> uh, I've called Comcast on my mom's behalf too, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> Cox overall, they, they've been good, but they, they had, they said a funny thing is they threatened to, you know, cap me and said, you, you, you're going to be going over. And then eventually, uh, flirting with that and then realizing, oh boy, business plans are going to be one third the speed at three times the cost. Why would I want to go to Cox business? So finally just sucked up and pay 50 bucks more to not have a limit. And so I'm part of that, you know, 5% of what they call abusers, I guess, but it's really just a corporate machine doing daily backups. It's not BitTorrents. Uh, it's not anything fancy. And people might want to do 4k video in my house someday from, four, you know, Netflix. It's a terrible conflict of interest for cable companies. And the guy, the guy from Cox admitted it like, uh, well, at least we held out longer than Comcast. In other words, he was telling me they threatened to cast for two years. You and I got those letters, Jim, yep, right? Yep, and he's basically yeah. telling me, at least we're not as crappy as our competitor, Comcast. <laughs> <laughs> and like it was especially honest, right? 1%, you know, we're 1% worse. Yeah, hats off to him for being so honest as, yeah. uh, as he was taking 50 bucks more of my money. Well, and on their site, they've been very, um, they've come out against or are in support of net neutrality. So they're like, hey, we are not, you know, I know co cable companies. I know you heard it was the cable companies, but not us. We're not, hmm. we're not for this, you know, what's Interesting. going on. So Cox right. is committed to experience for our customers. Visit our sports center to learn more about Cox's stance on net neutrality. Trash has yeah. Cox business. I have Cox business for a landline. You know, only uh, people in the support business where if you're on the phone 20, 30 hours, you don't want to be irritating people with VoIP calls and crappy quality. So I have a landline. Um, a separate coax cable running to the, sorry, separate cable running to the tree. It is coax, yep, out to the uh, post, sorry, the power. Um, oh, God, I'm tired. Yeah, me power too. Call, whatever the heck you call we'll it. Story and and anyhow, so yeah, Cox business is good. If my phone line goes down, they treat it like a business because it is, and you pay more for that. My consumer internet that's now uncapped by paying 50 bucks more is also quite good. 300 down, 30 up. I'm pretty blessed with that. Mm -hmm. Pretty awesome. We didn't capture that, but ADSL is some, or sorry, um, DSL is something I, uh, ADSL I had for years, of course. And then finally ISDN in the nineties. We didn't talk about that, but, yeah. um, I was the first That's guy to talk about, Yeah, but I think we covered most of it. It was, it was we did. fun for people. I, at one point had thought I might get two consumer lines and one line for me. The other line for the house, but that's so messy networking wise. And I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to mess with it. So I ended up with one and it, it works. And I, I, I watch every month I watch the cap kind of like, okay, am I going to get, and it, you know, a couple years ago, I never, I barely did 400 gig 
in a month, but lately I've been doing more and more. And now that I've been messing with these crypto cryptocurrency storage offerings, I'm hosting other people's data, which is, uh, you know, another deal. So, hey, if you're listening live, Paul, hang tight for one second. If you're listening live, we're going to cut you off at this point. Both Paul and I are pretty tired. I've been a long week. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to let him go in a second. But, guys, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, great stuff. Great having you in the chat room. And uh, Tony and Frodo and Mark, other Jim, Drashna, Don, Ken. Good to see you guys out there. Thanks for coming out tonight. We'll see you back next Thursday. See you guys.